Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's governance and scrutiny. Um, and we call for this adherent and the apologies, please, Stuart. Yep, thanks very much. And uh, morning, Chair and members. Um, so for the sedient, uh, Councillor Lillian Jones. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Neil Watts. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Councillor David Richardson. Here. Thank you. Have an apology from Councillor Stephen Canning. Uh, Councillor Peter Maben. Yeah, present. Thank yep. you. Thank you. An apology from Councillors Beverly Clark and Sally Cogley. Councillor William Lennox. Morning here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor June Kyle. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Jennifer Hogg. Yep, present. Thank you. Thank you. I have an apology from Councillor Elaine Stewart. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to welcome Laura Miller from Corporate Fraud Team in respect of item three on the agenda this morning. And also in chambers, we have Louisa Yule from Audit Scotland, who's observing the meeting this morning. So good morning. And also Karen Gray, manager from Corporate Fraud Team. OK, can we call for anybody with declarations of interest? Any declarations? No? OK. Thank you. For the previous minutes, pages three to nine. Can we agree the minute? Yep. Okay. Any matters arising from the minute? No. Okay. So in that case, we'll move straight to item three, which is a corporate fraud team 2223 annual report protecting the public purse working together to stamp out fraud. That's over to Ailey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Uh, I'll take you through very briefly the cover report and uh, Appendix 2, and then I'll hand over to Laura Miller from North Ayrshire Council. And Laura Miller, as you know, is my equivalent at North Ayrshire. Laura came out of our team at East Ayrshire, uh, and uh, we're also joined by Karen Gray, the manager of the corporate fraud team, and we'll all be happy to, to take questions. So, uh, as the chair said, the report is badged as uh, protecting the public purse, and that, that, at the end of the day, is the primary objective of all the anti-fraud work we do in the council is to protect the money to make sure it goes to the right people. And we are presenting this report today as the 22-23 annual report of the corporate fraud team. So we are presenting the background to uh, how we ended up with a corporate fraud team and uh, the work of the corporate fraud team in the last year, uh, which is a very positive uh, report today. So if I could just highlight uh, members paragraphs three to six, which give you the background to the story of the corporate fraud team. So it came about uh, through national changes in UK national changes in the way that uh, DWP uh, worked. And DWP took on some of the functions that previously sat in councils in terms of housing benefit fraud investigation. And that went over to the DWP uh, in a, a model they called the Single Fraud Investigation Service. So that left councils with uh, people that had previously investigated house and benefit fraud, some of whom went over to DWP, some of whom stayed in councils. In East Ayrshire, our people went to DWP. In North Ayrshire, they stayed in North Ayrshire. So really, staff had the option. It was it was it was that flexible. So North Ayrshire set up their own in-house corporate fraud team, and we were looking at options in East Ayrshire. What do we do? Do we have something in-house? Do we recruit to have an in-house team? Do we join up with somebody else? And we we looked at, at models that were working well elsewhere in the country, particularly in England, because England was a, a few years ahead of us in terms of this restructure of uh, benefit investigation. So we looked at what North Ayrshire were doing. They were getting good results in their first year, and we entered into partnership with North Ayrshire. That partnership's reviewed on a regular basis, and you'll note at paragraph six, the current uh, agreement um, is until the 31st of March 2025, and it will be reviewed by Cabinet 
uh, prior to that date. Um, previously, the reviews by Cabinet have included a benchmarking report from myself uh, in conjunction with Audit Glasgow, who we from time to time co-partner with to benchmark the corporate fraud team against corporate fraud teams and other councils in Scotland. So that was a good outcome, gave us a basis to continue that relationship. So relationship uh, is subject to challenge on a, a regular basis, and hopefully that will give members uh, some assurance. Uh, paragraphs 7 onward, uh, 7 to 13, lay out the respective roles of management, elected members, internal audit and the corporate fraud team. The internal audit team, uh, we're not expected to be experts in fraud investigation. We're expected to know what uh, the environment in which a fraud can thrive would look like. We're all about the controls, the governance, the controls and the risk management. And the corporate fraud team are about fraud investigation. That's their, uh, their expertise. So very complementary, but, uh, but different. And if we move on, the governance arrangements are laid out in paragraphs 14 and 15, which are aware I bring two reports to committee, one at mid-year and one this one today, the annual report. And we bring those up at the same time as the internal audit mid-year and annual reports. And we just thought that was sensible to align the reporting for the two complementary functions. So the bit that you'll be more interested in today, the achievements to date, uh, are laid out in paragraphs 16 to 18 and in appendices 1 and 2. So appendix 1 is a detailed report from the corporate fraud team, which Laura Miller will speak to. And appendix 2 is the summary that I present each year to members uh, to show the cumulative outcomes since the team uh, was established in January 2017, just to show you the, the cumulative impact of, of that work. Paragraph 17 uh, just puts a marker down for the COVID-19 impact. Um, you'll probably recall members when we brought the mid-year report up in uh, November, 3rd of November 22, uh, we touched on the, the COVID impact. And at that time, the chair uh, then uh, raised the awareness publicly about the corporate fraud team. And that had an impact last year. From, from November, we saw referrals increasing. And oh boy, have they increased since then. <laughs> Because for 22-23, we've had the highest number of referrals to the team ever since the team was established. So it's laid out in paragraph 18. So we've had 316 referrals made to the corporate fraud team for East Ayrshire uh, in 22-23. Now, they have a particular profile, those referrals. Uh, most of the referrals come from staff within the council and most of those internal referrals come from housing. So of the 316 referrals, 220 were from housing. Uh, and the head of housing and communities uh, spoke to the, the um, impact of the corporate fraud team at our recent council management team. And I've referred to uh, his words uh, in paragraph 18. So Blair Miller uh, was recognising the work of the corporate fraud team in contributing to service performance improvements across a range of indicators and noted the positive impact that had on people and communities. So just to give you a wee bit more insight into that, one of the, the key areas that the corporate fraud team work on with housing colleagues is abandonment, where people leave their council house and tenancies without telling the council. So they disappear. And uh, that used to be, we used to have quite a high level of abandonment since 17, 18, 2017-18, we had 105. In 2021-22, we had 35. So that's gone down to about a third of the level in 17-18. The corporate fraud team started work in 17-18 and Blair is attributing part of that improvement to the joint working with the corporate fraud team. So that's led to better sustainability of tenancies, which leads to health and wellbeing improvements. It's led to a reduction in loss of rent, so a reduction in void properties. So obviously when they're empty, we don't get the rent. And ultimately, uh, Blair's attributing all of those positive impacts 
to a reduction in the number of homelessness presentations to the council, because a lot of those who used to abandon tenancies would then come back round to our door to present themselves as, as homeless. So housing are seeing a lot of positive impacts through that joint working with the corporate fraud team. Uh, the other example we've given at paragraph 18 is uh, blue badges. Uh, which, as we know, we talked about this back in November. Blue badges tends to be the only area that the National Fraud Initiative um, identifies for this council. We usually find a few blue badges that are still out there in circulation uh, where people have died. And that's one of the data matches that the National Fraud Initiative carries out. So the corporate fraud team work with our health and social care colleagues and with our parking attendants. Parking attendants have a list of badges that um, where the, the badge holders have died. They check those badges are not being used out in our streets and where they are, they report it through health and social care and to the corporate fraud team and letters are issued to advise people, advise the families that you're not supposed to do that. And then that will be escalated if that behaviour doesn't change. So that, uh, again, has a positive impact on our communities. Paragraphs 19 to 21 uh, lay out the wider benefits, but I, I think I've already touched on that at paragraph 18. So it's not just about recovering monies, it's that more positive impact uh, on our communities. It's also about giving senior management and elected members assurance, because a lot of the work that the corporate fraud team do gives us assurance that our controls are strong. Uh, and um, there are two examples noted at paragraph 21, and they're laid out in appendix two as part of the cumulative impact of the work of the team. So, for example, in 2019-20, an exercise was carried out to data match council tax debt to the council's payroll. And this is quite a common exercise for corporate fraud teams to do across the country. In other councils, uh, the corporate fraud teams have identified maybe six-figure sums where there's council tax debt related to employees that there's no repayment plans in place for. So when the corporate fraud team matched that data for this council, there were no outstanding payment agreements. Every single employee that had council tax debt was already subject to a repayment arrangement with the finance service. And that gave us lots of assurance uh, as officers, but also uh, for you as elected members, that our controls were working well there uh, as a council. Most recently, and Laura will say a wee bit more about this when she talks about the detail in Appendix 1, uh, the team, we asked the team to go out and look at some non-domestic rates properties, so some commercial properties in the community. Uh, we had um, we, we wanted some assurance that those properties that were getting empty property relief truly were eligible for empty property relief. So the team visited 161 properties in the community and have only identified recoveries of £5,000, which is fabulous. That's a very low rate of recovery. Gives us a lot of assurance that our uh, revenue and benefits team who manage non-domestic rates are doing a good job. So that, again, uh, is a very positive wider benefit of the, the corporate fraud team. Paragraph 22 and 23 gives you a, a short update on the National Fraud Initiative, which, as you know, is run every two years, although it feels like it's run all the time because you're constantly working on it. But the, nationally, it's only report, it's reported on every two years. And you remember I brought the last, uh, and, uh, the, the last um, NFI report up to you on 3rd of November, and that was for the 2021 exercise. Uh, and that identified, again, a number of blue badges that were still out in the community uh, belonging to, to people who had, who had passed away. Uh, so very low level of fraud and error in that report. And that report is on the councillor's notice board uh, for you to for you to refer to. So the 22-23 exercise is currently underway. So the Cabinet Office has got all of our data. So 1,200 public bodies, public and private bodies, but predominantly public bodies in the UK, give their data to the Cabinet Office. So it's HMRC, it's DWP, it's all the councils, it's all the other public bodies, and all that data is matched by, uh, by the Cabinet Office. And then they send us back what they think are potential frauds and potential errors. 
Um, there's there's a lot of matches, and most of the matches for us have got legitimate reasons for being matches, uh, and there is no fraud and error. So our services plough through those matches uh, and identify uh, any that need further uh, action in terms of recovery, for example. Uh, so we're currently working with the services uh, through that 22-23 exercise and we'll bring the, the results of that to you in, in due course. The paragraph 24 just puts the marker down for external audit's opinion of the arrangements we have in the Council for dealing with fraud. And that was a very positive observation that was made by external audit when they reported to committee on the 3rd of November 22 in their annual report. And that has been a recurring opinion year on year that this council has good fraud arrangements in place. We're never complacent. We can always get better. Uh, we always know there's continuous improvement, but that at least gives you some assurance that we're, we're, doing, we're doing a lot of good things and we're doing a lot of things right. Uh, but we, we're always learning and we're always looking out there for, for good practice. So. I think that's everything I wanted to say in the, the cover report. And uh, unless there's any questions at, at this stage, Chair, I was going to pass over to Laura to go into uh, Appendix 1 in detail and just talk to you about the work on the ground during 22-23 in a bit more detail by the Corporate Fraud Team. Thank you. Thanks, Ailey. Does anybody have any questions or comments at this point? No. Nobody online? No. No. OK. We'll just go on to Appendix 1 then. So introduce Laura Miller. Hello, Laura. Over to you. Good morning and thank you very much for having me here. Um, and thank you very much to Ailey, obviously, for such a, a comprehensive uh, introduction to this report as well. Um, I'm obviously here to present the, the details of the activities of the corporate fraud team for 22-23, but I think it's probably worthwhile just starting with, again, a bit of a quick reminder about who we are and, and how we came about. Obviously, Ailey's gone into a bit of detail about that already. Um, she's talked about the history there and the establishment of the corporate fraud team in 2017 and what instigated that in terms of the changes within the DWP. Um, as Ailey said, in North Ayrshire Council, we didn't uh, lose our, our benefit fraud investigators. Um, we retained them within the council. And what also happened was we had a member of the internal audit team move over to become the supervisor for the corporate fraud team, who is now the manager. When we went into partnership with East Ayrshire Council, we recruited two additional investigators to cover that additional workload. So we now have a team of four investigators and a team manager. Um, in terms of their background, uh, obviously the team manager has got significant qualifications, not only now within corporate fraud, but also brought over from internal audit, the Institute of Internal Audit qualification as well. And I would say that that is completely priceless when it comes to doing some of our investigation work, because what we can do is as well as identifying or investigating those particular frauds, we can also highlight not only to our own council, but also to East Ayrshire Council through Ailey and Paul Davis, if we can see that if there's any control weaknesses that they might want to consider. And that's where we have that link in between the, the corporate fraud team and the internal audit team. Obviously, two of the members of the, the team, because they moved over um, from the, the revenues and benefits team, they have got extensive experience of investigating um, housing benefit fraud and have brought a number of skills and tools with them. One of the members of the team is also ex-police. And we've also, re well, recently it's been nearly two years, I think, that we recruited somebody um, from the antisocial behaviour um, team within North Ayrshire Council, who has got, again, significant experience of, of carrying out investigations in another way. But it's, again, adding to that sheer diversity that we have within the team to, to investigate really anything that does come our way. So back when the, the partnership was introduced, we, we drew up uh, between the councils a partnership agreement and that sets out the work that we do on behalf of East Ayrshire Council. So that includes investigating the likes of council tax, business rates, um, Scottish Welfare Fund, discretionary housing payments, blue badges and housing tenancies. So that's really, again, a bit of background to the team, which I think is just quite helpful as a bit of a refresher um, uh, for the for the committee. Uh, but I think Ailey's covered a lot in quite a bit of detail this morning, so I'll take the report as read and I'll, I'll just cover some of the, the salient points. 
Um, in terms of Appendix 1, that details the activities of the team during 22-23, and we draw this from the very detailed management information that we, we retain on, on all the referrals that we receive. As Ailey highlighted, we have received well in excess of the number of referrals that we've ever had in the past, you know, never mind kind of pre-COVID as well. Obviously, we did see a bit of a dip during COVID, but to have 316 in the year is obviously quite a significant increase over the, the highest we've ever had prior to that was 199 in 2018-19. As Ailey said, the majority of these are received from internal sources within the council, 261 of them, with 220 of those coming from housing. I think it was really pleasing for me to read in the report, uh, obviously before the committee today, and I, I saw Ailey's cover report, and I think it's really pleasing to hear the acknowledgement um, from Blair Miller on the, the work of the corporate fraud team. And I think it's important that we put thanks to, to both of those teams, um, the corporate fraud team and housing, for the, the proactive uh, nature of the work that they are carrying out and the relationship that they have built together. I think it's important in the report to pull out not just the the financial outcomes, uh, but also the 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 non financial outcomes, because as we know, prevention is better than cure. And I think in terms of some of the proactive work that we are carrying out, again, particularly with housing, um, there's a number of preventative measures that we're we're undertaking, such as housing succession checks, making sure that properties are going to the right people in the community and the people that need them the most. And it's definitely the case that preventative measures are a more cost effective way of tackling this tenancy fraud. The corporate fraud team continues to investigate 100% of referrals from all sources. Obviously, they are risk assessed within the team. We have a, a kind of quality identifier to determine the ones that we are most likely to get the most results from. But nonetheless, 100% of referrals, even ones that are perhaps classed as a, a lower quality of referral, are all investigated. And we will continue to do so until such time as we are unable due to any kind of resource restrictions upon that. So as, as well as the reactive work, we also carry out proactive exercises and these are often discussed with Ailey and Paul Davis in advance to, to try and tackle any new areas, any potentially interesting areas. As Ailey said, we're always open to, to new areas of working, um, anything that we think could achieve some potentially interesting results. But as Ailey mentioned, in terms of that proactive exercise for 22-23, that really did give some, some really good assurance over the controls that are operating within East Ayrshire. I think it's also important to highlight at this point that there's a, a slightly more normal return of proceedings by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. It goes without saying that they were very much hit by the, the COVID pandemic and the, the backlog of cases that, that they were hearing. Uh, but we are now seeing cases going through the courts, not only within East Ayrshire, but also within North Ayrshire as well. And there was one case that was recently heard in court. Um, it was a an outcome that was previously reported in 2019-20, but that concluded in court in October 2022 with a guilty verdict and 170 hours of community payback. In terms of NFI, I just wanted to again add, add another point to that uh, on top of what Ailey had mentioned. Um, again, going back to always looking for new ways of working, so too are the Cabinet Office. So when it comes to the NFI, they're they're always seeking new ways of data matching, other information they can gather, other bodies that they can match between. So they always go out with pilot exercises, and they're they're recently um they they've recently gone out to consultation on another pilot exercise, which our response to that has been yes, absolutely, let's give it a go, and that's the approach that we will always take. Um, if if there's something that we think. We're not 100% sure what the benefit of that may be, but let's see and we'll know after the event what, what the outcome of that is. In terms of the, the comments that Ailey made on the, the arrangements for corporate fraud, obviously that's something that we um, feed into with the external auditors as well, so they do come and meet with us also. If there's any questions also come through East Ayrshire, um, we're there to, to support that process as well in the same way, way as we do for North Ayrshire as well. So they're the salient points that I really wanted to pull out today, Chair. Um, thank you very much for your, your time today and thank you for having me along and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was a really interesting report. <clears throat> um, again, 
corporate fraud team are just demonstrating value for this council. Um, I mean, I think when we see the, the engagement and the relationships between services and corporate fraud team, um, it's really reassuring. And given, you know, the outcomes of the referrals, um, well, in terms of 100% investigation of each referral, but the outcomes of some of the um, referrals, especially from housing, and what that's, you know, come back 58 tenancy recoveries. I mean, that's staggering. I mean, as elected members, we know the pressures in housing and we know the numbers of people waiting um, on the waiting list for housing. So that's, for me, that's huge. Um, and again, that's a non-financial outcome, but it's a huge outcome nevertheless. Um, I think it's all, always good to raise awareness, um, you know, about stamping out fraud wherever we can. And certainly um, through the last awareness campaign, yeah, numbers, well, the numbers have really shot up. It's the highest ever recorded since um, the, the, the partnership arrangement. So, I mean, that's positive. So thank you very much for that. Does anybody have any questions or comments for either Eli or Laura? Councillor Mabin. Thank you. Um, you were saying you've got a, a small team of four plus a manager um, and uh, you're looking at a, a record increase in the number of cases you're investigating. Is, is your team big enough? Have you got enough people to cope with the workload or are you looking to grow your team? Thanks very much for the question, Councillor. Um, at this time, we aren't planning to grow the team. Um, yet, as you point out, we do have two investigators and one manager. In terms of the number of referrals that we receive, the the difficulty with planning workload is that you don't always know exactly how long a referral is going to take to investigate. There are many at the moment that will still be relatively open and closed cases and don't require more than a few hours of work. There are others which obviously take significantly longer. And this, I suppose, is where I'm, I'm kind of going back to talking about the I would continue to encourage the proactive side of things far more. And I think that is something that we've got that really good relationship with, like I said, in particular with housing, because those proactive checks take less time to deal with than those checks where you're dealing with where a fraud has potentially already happened. So at this time, um, there's no plans to grow the team. The That discussion will come at a time that we are struggling to continue to investigate 100% of referrals because there'll be a decision to be made at that point of do we continue to investigate 100% of referrals or do we need to think about the team structure? And that's something that we will obviously fully engage with Ailey on if that discussion needs to come to pass. Thanks, Laura. Does anybody else have any questions, comments? Councillor um, Mabin, you're coming back in. Come back in if there's anybody else. Um, Ailey, your, your corporate fraud team are doing a very good job. It looks like uh, you're stopping finding fraud attempts by the public as far as housing benefit, blue badges and voids in houses and stuff. Uh, can you tell me a wee bit about how the team look at our officers? In particular, I'm thinking about of, of our officers and managers do they use credit cards? Are they, they buying things with credit cards? How is or debit cards? How is that monitored and controlled? Do you chair councillor? Yes, we do use debit cards and credit cards as a council. Uh, that's very well controlled. That would be a responsibility primarily for management and the relevant services to, to manage that aspect. We wouldn't expect the corporate fraud team to be uh, managing that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and the checking the controls in that area would tend to sit with my team in internal audit. So, and in fact, in the internal audit plan for 23-24, we've got a, a review of those debit and credit card arrangements, which we agreed with Joe McLachlan. So the, we looked at that a few years ago. There was no significant issues. And in the meantime, uh, we've also worked with finance when the bank changed changed the arrangements for the debit and credit cards during, uh, I think it was during the pandemic, it was a couple of years ago, and uh, the bank had uh, actually increased uh, the uh, the uh, increased the robustness of the arrangements around uh, around debit and credit credit cards. So it's uh, it's 
pretty well pinned down. But we are going to do a review of that this year and we'll bring that uh, the results of that review back to committee. So that would tend to be more work for internal audit as opposed to the, the corporate fraud team. Uh, so that it's very complementary what we do and it's not always maybe clear uh, when you're looking at the, the work internal audit do and corporate fraud team do, where, maybe where those boundaries are. And sometimes the boundaries are a bit blurred. Uh, and the, that comes back to the, the question, the earlier question you asked about resourcing. If there's, Laura and I talk about priorities on a regular basis, and if there were any areas that we were both very, very concerned about, we would look at pulling our resources to make sure this council's protected. Because at the end of the day, for me, it's about protecting this council. And we need to make sure we use all our resources sensibly to do that. So hopefully that gives you, you some assurance. Hopefully I've asked, answered your question about the, the cards and the employees. Oh, just, sorry, just to touch on that, one of the things that uh, Eddie will be doing uh, when he reports back, uh, Eddie, as you know, uh, each week prepares a blog for the employees of the council. So um, every week that highlights reports that have gone up to the relevant committees in week. So this week's blog will highlight this committee. And as part of that highlight, uh, he's also going to promote the awareness again of the corporate fraud team and all of the contact numbers for the corporate fraud team, which are on the council's website. But promote that again to all the employees in the council, because every employee's got the right to contact the corporate fraud team freely. Uh, and I think staff are, uh, Linda, I see is nodding away there, so that's great. Education are well aware of this, but I think teams generally are well aware. Um, the fact that housing and our uh, Ayrshire Roads Alliance uh, services are the only two services we've mentioned so far today, that's just about the nature of their work and it lends itself to more to the work that the corporate fraud team do. But every service is, is aware and certainly all the council management team are very aware of the corporate fraud team and aware that the service is there. And we do sometimes pull them in uh, creatively uh, from time to time in, in various areas. So it's about using all of those resources in the best way for this council. Linda, did you want to come in? Yes, through you, Chair and, and Councillor Maben, absolutely, hopefully, um, answering your question there. Um, in terms of us representing the biggest service uh, in the Council, I'd just like to kind of amplify and agree around about what, what Ailey has said, because um, I can understand that, you know, given the scope for fraud in that area, particularly around about credit cards and debit cards. So um, in my own line of, of, of leadership management, I have sight of anybody and everybody who has a, a credit card in the organisation. Um, in education, can I just say, uh, individual officers do not have the facility of credit cards. Where, where we see them in education is generally with schools, OK, around about certain purchases that might require made, et cetera, or emergencies for trips. So I'm, I'm sure you understand. So we have a sign off procedure. So every new card that's issued must come through myself uh, for approval. And the limits assigned to those cards are also um, very, can I just say, reasonable um, in terms of not being exorbitant in any way um, that might attract fraudulent type behaviours. So we then have a member of staff assigned to us who then would work directly with Ailey and the team in internal audit if any suspicions are raised. So all of the spend is then sent back to our central offices and if there's any sort of suspicious activity it would be Ailey's team would contact in terms of internal audit uh, and actually invoke um, investigative procedures. So just to say it is incredibly well managed by Ailey and the team, but at individual service level, it's also, you know, I hope uh, very well managed in terms of all of that and something that we all keep our eye on. And I think, you know, really the, the leadership of, of Ailey um, and indeed the work of the team really help us to do that. Thanks, thanks Linda. Councillor Richardson and then Councillor maybe want to come back in. Okay. Thanks, Chair. I think Linda just answered my my question. I was going to say, I, you know, in the, for previous employers, uh, I've held credit card accounts for expenses and entertaining and stuff like that. And uh, my experience would have been that normally I would have submitted the uh, the account and that particular card maybe to my line manager once a month. Would that be fair to say that's the sort of similar sort of check within the accounts? Yeah, it's very similar. It, it's actually uh, quite a digitised system these days. The bank have put in place quite a digital system. So you require to submit all the evidence to back up each transaction or it creates an alert. So we had looked at the, the establishment of those arrangements with our finance colleagues and I was very happy with the, the revision of the arrangements over the last couple of years. But as Linda said, it's very well controlled within services. We rarely have any issues around the debit and credit cards. I think people are 
incredibly careful about how they use them, uh, and not least of all because they know uh, they know about the the level of scrutiny and oversight that, that's around the credit and debit tars. Not least of all, also by our corporate procurement team who see all the spend that goes through the debit and credit cards as well. So there's a number of eyes on on this area. Thanks, thanks, Ailey. Councillor Mavin. Thank you, Ailey and Linda, for that's an excellent answer. And it's, it's good to hear that East Ayrshire Council officers with credit cards are well audited, controlled and monitored in what they buy with those credit cards. Unfortunately, across politics, this is not always the case. It's nice to know we have an excellent corporate fraud team on top of the job at East Ayrshire Council. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Does MD else have any questions or comments? Okay, Laura, thank you very much for your report. We send our thanks to your team and yourself for um, the work that you do on behalf of East Ayrshire Council. Um, and also, I think it would be good, you know, to be able to meet the full team at one point. Ailey, would that be um, a reasonable ask? For governance and scrutiny, to absolutely, the absolutely. We ha we have done that in the past, and uh, all I think all of the members now of the corporate fraud team have actually attended governance and scrutiny committee uh, over the years. And in fact, the the most recent uh, addition to the team, Graham, who came from the antisocial behaviour team at North Ayrshire Council, uh, joined governance and scrutiny committee in one of the back rows a few months ago, just to to get to know the committee. Uh, so we need to we need to get the committee to get to know the corporate fraud team a wee bit better as well. So we can absolutely arrange that. So we can we can decide what's the best format for that going forward, Chair. Uh, we'll take our, our lead from committee. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Ellie. OK, thanks very much, Laura, for your report once again. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you for all the support. And of course, we will we'll get the, the team together um, and, and come across to East Ayrshire. Uh, we'll organise that through Ailey, but I appreciate the support, Chair. You're very welcome. Thank okay, you. members, can we agree the recommendations on page page everyone? Page 10. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, and we'll go into item four, internal audit 22-23 annual report, the detailed report from Ailey. Cross yourself. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just one final point, actually, in the Corporate Fraud Team report is we always welcome ideas from members for the proactive work. So if there's any areas that you would like us to, to look into, in fact, I'll email all the committee members uh, after today just to, to, to put that offer out there. But we're always very keen to hear from anybody in the Council of areas they think would be worthwhile for us to, to look at uh, as a Corporate Fraud Team. So on to the, the next report, uh, which is a complimentary report report to the summary annual report that I brought you up uh, on 20th, 20th of April. Uh, and it's a bit of an oddity because of our regulations and when we have to do stuff uh, that we bring up two reports. We bring up a summary annual report, which uh, was the 20th of April report, which included the annual opinion. So as you know, uh, our statutory requirements require me to bring up an annual opinion uh, to inform the annual governance statement, which Ian Tuff brought uh, to you on 20th of April as well. Now, in addition to that, we're also required to bring you the detail of our work, uh, performance indicators around our work, and what our um, public sector internal audit standards uh, also refer to, a quality assurance and improvement programme. Uh, it's not the snappiest of titles, but uh, basically it's an action plan of stuff that we've identified for continuous improvement and how we're doing with that. And that includes any actions that come out of the external quality assessments. And you'll remember that Ray Gard from SIPFA was here on the 20th of April to present that um, external independent review of internal audit and thankfully it was a very very positive report which was good for all of us. Uh, so just uh, briefly uh, in terms of the cover report we um, have laid out uh, in the first few paragraphs the reason for this report and the statutory and regulatory requirements and referring back to the detail of those requirements which was laid out in the paper on the 20th of April so I'm not going to go into those again in any detail. 
The paragraph six to seven uh, give you a, an update on our professional networks. Uh, paragraph six would refer to the Slack AIG annual report for 2022. It's done on a, a calendar basis. And so Slack AIG, as you know, is the Scottish Local Authority's chief internal auditors group. It's got the worst acronym in Scotland, but it's memorable. Uh, so it's, it's the, that group's been up and running for at least 20 years, and we're not going to change it now. So I'm in the management committee for that group. I was chair of it a few years ago. So we're, we're, we're mired in that group. So we're at the, the centre of that group. So the annual report for that group, which reinforces the work that we've contributed nationally, is on the councillor's notice board at the, the link there. But it'll also identify for you the, um, the scope of that group and the 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 breadth of that and uh, the width of that uh, scope and the engagement we have with other national bodies like Audit Scotland, for, for example. So... Uh, following the public pound, as you know, uh, is an obligation for the council where we have to track funds across organisational boundaries. So where money goes out from this council to other organisations, we have to track where it goes and we support that obligation. Uh, and the, the work that we've done to demonstrate that is laid out at paragraph eight with the cross references in to the relevant appendices that are presented uh, today. And there's more information about that engagement under following the public pound in the up to paragraph 12. And again, I'm not going to go into that in detail because we've gone over that before at, at previous uh, committees. The plan achievement is laid out in paragraphs 13 to 16. So as you know, we started the year, we started 22-23 in not the best place uh, for us as a team. We had a number of people off in long-term sick, we had vacancies, uh, and we started the year with 700 projected audit days, which was about the lowest number of days that we had as a team for a good number of years. And then we... People came back to work and we also recruited. We recruited a senior auditor from Glasgow City Council. So that allowed me to come back to committee later in the year with uh, a plan of 950 days. Uh, so, and we've actually achieved 962. We're pretty good at the projections of the number of days that we're, we're going to deliver. So 962 days in total. But the in-house team target was 900 days as laid out in the table. Uh, paragraph 13. So the in-house team have achieved 934 days, so 103, almost 104% of what we projected. Uh, and we've delivered uh, on all of the items in the plan, some of which we're crossing the T's and dotting the I's on now, and some reports uh, still awaiting um, loading onto the, the councillor's notice board. The Appendix, appendix four, our performance indicators, will go into a bit more detail about the statistics around our delivery, and uh, I'll 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 go over that when we when we get to appendix four. So, in terms of the uh, in terms of the additional appendices here. Paragraph 18 tells the story of why we've got Appendix 4. That was the first external quality assessment report in 1718, uh, recommended that we present a suite of performance indicators to committee. Performance indicators for internal audit are notoriously difficult to develop and um, have, have never really uh, developed well nationally. And for me, Actually, the real performance indicator for you is, do we deliver the plan? Are we delivering the jobs? Are we giving you the reports? Can I do my annual opinion? That's really our performance indicator. But we're also required to give you some more detailed performance indicators. So that's what Appendix 4 is all about. The Quality Assurance and Improvement Programme in the background to that is laid out at paragraphs 19 to 21. And I'll highlight some of the some of the aspects of that. So I mentioned earlier that's our action plan uh, relating to continuous improvement, and the paragraphs there lay out the reason why we do that, and it is a statutory and regulatory obligation. Um, I think it has a value, but again, the real value is me being able to say to you, we've delivered the plan. So paragraph 22 just puts the marker down for the annual opinion that we brought to you on 20th of April, which we continued to say reasonable assurance can be placed on the council's arrangements for governance, internal control and risk management. So what you've got in this report today, appendices one to three, 
is details of the work that underpin that annual opinion. So Appendix 1 is new today, and that's the detail of the work. Appendices 2 and 3 were presented to you on the 20th of April, and there are minor updates in red on Appendices 2 and 3, very minor updates. So Appendix 1 is where we're laying out the detail of the work. So Appendices 2 and 3 are the summary, Appendix 1 is the detail, and Appendix 1 cross-references to all the job numbers in Appendices 2 and 3. So I'll just highlight a few of those pieces of work in Appendix 1. So that's on page, starts on page 26. So our regulations require us to report any significant findings, but what I'm saying to you very clearly in paragraph 1 is, there are no findings of an adverse significant nature. So that still allows me to give that annual opinion of reasonable assurance. But uh, nevertheless, we still need to report significant findings, but uh, we'll just have that clarity that there are no adverse significant findings. So a lot of positive, a lot of learning, a lot of continuous improvement identified. Uh, I would be I, I would be worried if every job we did come out in sound assurance or sound in most areas. Uh, and they don't, and they shouldn't, because then we're not looking at the right areas. So a number of, two areas have come out with limited assurance, and the services have uh, engaged with us and been, you know, immediately uh, onto those areas to uh, improve the internal controls. Those areas are not a significance that is of concern to me. Um, and that's laid out at paragraph three, which gives you the overall summary of the outcomes, which I've presented again on 20th of April. So nine of the 19 completed assignments resulted in either sound assurance or sound assurance in most areas, which is our top score. That's good. That's a really good outcome. Um, so if we look at the highlights of work in paragraphs four and uh, following, we, paragraph four, uh, puts the marker down for the work we did around risk management, and that led to the development of the Strategic Risk Officers Group, which Eddie is now chairing, and that, um, uh, which will oversee uh, the risk management function in the council, and that will report into the council management team. Paragraph five mentions the bank mandate fraud work we carry out annually, uh, and that again has resulted in really good outcomes. Finance do a really good job in stopping, identifying and stopping uh, fraudulent attacks on uh, creditors, which is, is nationally referred to as bank mandate fraud, where a fraudster will try and change the supplier's bank account. So you've heard me talking about this before. During last year, we became aware of an attack on a council not that far away from here, not in Ayrshire, but not that far away from here, and uh, just over four million over a couple of invoices uh, was actually successfully attacked by a fraudster, and the council changed the a contractor's bank account without properly checking the request for that change, and it was the bank who spotted the change and said, "Oh, didn't realise that contractor had changed their bank account." Queried it by the council, and the payment was stopped. So that that was a near miss, um, and that's happened in other councils. It's never happened here, and we hope it won't happen here. And the controls we've got here, they're not particularly sophisticated. You know, it's about double checking. It's about double checking and due, due diligence. It's not that complicated, but it falls down elsewhere. And we know it falls down because they uh, they put their procedures to the side and just try and do things quickly. And here we adhere to the procedures and we look at it every single year. But we don't tell finance when we're going to look at it. We do unannounced work. We go and look at it at different points in the year. And uh, we look for the evidence that every time they've changed a bank account, we run a report that shows us all the bank account, supplier bank accounts that have changed. We look at the evidence for that and we've never found one that's been a successful fraudulent attempt. Um, I was just going to ask, what is the procedure for a supplier changing their bank account? Does the supplier submit the new bank details to us by letter? Or do we get a, a BACS advice from the banks? Or how does it work? These days, it tends to be email. And an email will come into finance to say, hello, I'm from X, uh, and uh, I want to change the bank account of the company. So our finance team have a standing record of legitimate contacts for that supplier. So they will go back, they will check that that's come from the legitimate contact. 
uh, or they will go back using the known telephone number uh, or they will double check that that email address is the correct email address. So they will only engage with a known supplier contact. Now, we had a wee bit of a concern about this over COVID because they all went home to work and a lot of the contact numbers we had were landlines. But we soon found out that most of the companies had diverted the landline numbers to their employees' uh, company mobile phones, which worked very well. So our finance colleagues were still phoning the landline number, the known landline number, and getting through to their known contact. And of course, they build up relationships with people over years. They know who they're talking to. You know, they'll ask the questions. You know, how are you getting on? How so? So, you know, they build up those relationships. So that doesn't, the, the councils we know have been hit and hit big uh, and we know what's happened there and it's where they just haven't, they've blindly followed an instruction that's come in through an email irrespective of what email address it's come from. So it's been as simple as that. So the controls are not that complicated, but you know, if you do it right, they work. Yep, so uh, yeah, good, thank you. Uh, so if we move on, um, Paragraph six uh, just gives you some background to a job that we carried out with greener communities on their purchasing arrangements. And we worked closely with corporate procurement in that job. And it was clear that there was a good relationship between the service and corporate procurement. And actually the, the greener communities had asked us to do that work as part of their continuous improvement work. They had had a few changes in their, um, their, uh, their team, a few new people in the team. You know, they were, they were just making sure that everything was being done done properly. So we went in and we did, you know, some assurance work. We checked that they were following the, the procedures, but we also carried out some advisory work with them. So uh, so it's a good example of, of the way in which we engage with services. Paragraph eight talks about the work we do with heritage assets. As you know, we have a role in assurance programme and uh, we, in 22-23, we continue to check that those 44, 43.4, I think it is, million pounds worth of heritage assets, um, we were physically checking a sample and we look at the storage arrangements, we look at arrangements for moving the assets and we look at arrangements for recording those assets. Uh, as you probably know, members, we've got one of the biggest collections out with the cities in Scotland. So uh, it's, it's something we're all very proud of, but obviously we need to keep an eye on it. So uh, we do that year on year. And in the last few weeks, uh, my team have been involved in uh, overseeing the movement of uh, the heritage assets back to the Dean Castle. Uh, so we were involved in that process as well. So we will continue year on year uh, to look at those arrangements. And, you know, there was no significant issues uh, arising there. Paragraph eight mentions the work we've done around cyber security and the bulk of we, the work we did in 22-23 was around the SEPA attack. Uh, and the reason for that was um, Scottish government uh, produced, along with some other partner agencies, including Police Scotland and uh, the National Cyber Security Centre, which, as you know, is linked to GCHQ, um, reviewed the uh, the license there and a uh, gap analysis document was produced nationally. We got early, early sight of that from Scottish Government because uh, ourselves and our IT colleagues work closely with Scottish Government colleagues and we're quite often uh, consulted earlier than other uh, councils to take a view on these uh, areas. So we had that um, gap analysis quite early uh, in the process. And we started working to benchmark that to the arrangements in the council with our IT colleagues. And that, again, no significant issues and strong engagement with ICT colleagues uh, who we work with uh, very closely. Uh, I'll just mention another couple of areas uh, as we, we run through this report. Uh, job 12 was some work we did with um, the place-based investment programme with uh, Blair Miller's team and uh, the, the team we were working with had a lot of new uh, officers in it who hadn't dealt with internal audit before. And I'd approached them and said, it's a new area. I think we need to have a look at this. It's about a million quid a year from Scottish government. Let's have a look and see if we're doing this the best way we can possibly do it. And to be fair to them, they had put a lot of continuous improvement in place since they'd started managing the fund. But there was a few more areas we were able to develop with them. But the best feedback I got from that team was, oh, I didn't realise that's what internal audit did. I thought you were the police. Uh, 
Does it not? We work with you and we work with you to get the best result for this council. So I think the word that was used was inspirational, which I thought was maybe a wee bit too generous, but it's the first time the work of the team has been called inspirational. So that was quite nice. <laughs> so it just gives you a kind of flavour of the, the work that we're doing. Uh, paragraph 15 uh, mentions the work we've done around the statutory performance indicators and the local government benchmark and framework indicators. So those are the indicators that came up to you recently in September in the annual report uh, from Ian Tuff. And the what do internal audit do around this work? Well, the report is on the councillor's notice board, uh, the job eight report, and the full title of that report is in appendix two under job eight. And that work is um, annual. We do a rolling programme of looking at all the performance indicators. But last year, not only did we look at the indicators and the evidence that lay behind a sample of the indicators, we also checked that the arrangements for the collation of the data were following the new arrangements that we put in place with the service uh, about two years ago. We worked with them to improve the arrangements. So uh, it's it's not just about that policing bit, checking that the evidence is there, it's looking at the, the processes and making sure that they are the best processes uh, for the, the council. Paragraph 17 mentions the data analytics work, which we were progressing uh, during 2022-23. Um, and that came to a bit of a halt during uh, COVID because we had to focus on the COVID grants. So we didn't do much data analytics work around any other areas in the council. We are now turning our attention to doing wider data analytics work. We've got some really powerful software that we've had for about 20 years and we've used it on a number of jobs and we're now trying to focus that to the best uh, advantage of the council. And we've just recruited two graduate interns with strong data analytics background and they start on the 19th of June. So really looking forward to having them in the team and I think that'll allow us to really make um, significant steps in widening out that data analytics work we do where we will take various data sets across the council and carry out various checks to uh, check for fraud and error. So complementary to some of the work that the corporate fraud team are doing and the National Fraud Initiative but, you know, sort of filling in uh, gaps uh, and targeting it to areas where uh, we think possibly might be, there might be um, a risk. Uh, so if we, we work down, you can see that uh, the, the breadth of the work we, we've done. Paragraph 18 mentions uh, computer audit work we've done around externally hosted data, which includes cloud storage. And that was advisory work where we've created with outsourced partners a checklist uh, for uh, the council to use each time we're entering into externally hosted data arrangements, which are much more common these days uh, than they were a number of years ago. Uh, paragraph 13 talks about payment control work we did with ARA uh, across three areas of work, and that involved uh, my team being out and about uh, down at Victoria Bridge, looking at how things are measured before we pay any contractors. So uh, again, gives you a flavour of the, the type of work that we, we do. Uh, paragraph 22 mentions the assurance work we do around the climate change public sector report, uh, which, as you know, is submitted to Scottish Government every year. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a monster of a report, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> having reviewed it. Uh, and we've got a rolling programme where we look at certain areas every year and we started with the, the higher risk areas in year one. We did that in the back of speaking to the chief exec of the climate change, uh, of the, sorry, of the relevant unit um, at Scottish Government. And he came to speak to the chief auditors a number of years ago and he was really keen on internal audit, becoming engaged in reviewing these returns and the, they were hoping a systematic process would be put in place nationally. That's never happened, but we just grabbed the initiative and we started doing that work in this council. And there's a few other councils across Scotland are doing similar work to review those returns, but it hasn't become a standard approach across Scotland. So we're actually going to address that at our Chief Auditors Conference, which we're holding in June down at Dumfries House. And we've got Audit Scotland and Scottish Government come along to speak to us and to try and establish good practice around the climate change assurance area across Scotland. So I think at the moment we are 
doing a good job there. But again, we're not complacent. And I'm really keen to see if we can get some continuous improvement out of that session uh, at our, our national conference. Uh, Ayrshire Growth Deals mentioned at paragraphs 23 and 24, where I've got a senior auditor embedded in the, the programme management office for the AGD. So he's uh, the critical friend for the AGD and he's currently working on improving the risk register. Uh, so, Chair, I wasn't going to mention anything else. I think the uh, hopefully the descriptions there uh, are enough to give committee a good flavour of the breadth of the work that we've done across the council. Uh, appendix two, as I mentioned, is, uh, is the appendix you saw in the 20th of April with some minor updates. They're not of a, a significance that I'm going to go into. Appendix three has one update and that's all the follow-up assignments that we've, we've carried out. And again, appendix three you saw on the 20th of April and there's uh, one job, uh, an ARA job there that's been updated. But it continues the pattern as 100% implementation. So, as you know, the follow-up assignments we do are where we go out about a year after we make recommendations to services and we go out and check that the service has implemented the recommendation. Again, that's no about policing the implementation of the recommendation. It's about assurance and it's about being able to provide assurance to senior management and uh, committee that recommendations are being implemented. In this council, the pattern for the last few years has been 100% implementation. But quite frankly, I'm not going to bring you something that's not 100%. So we will work with services until it's 100%. Services are always committed to implementing the recommendations. Sometimes things take a wee bit longer. Sometimes things come in left field. Sometimes the sometimes the economy goes a bit pear-shaped and things uh, change. Sometimes government make decisions that means the, the environment you're working in changes. So we work with services until the, um, the recommendations are fully implemented and we'll give them the time and space where that's required to uh, implement those recommendations. I know in some other councils, the internal audit work a cut-off date. So if you haven't implemented your recommendations within X number of months, a report comes up to committee to say, look, they haven't done it. And to me, that's not of any value. So that's not the approach we take in this council. Having said that, if we were ever to have a, a service that just didn't implement and had no intentions of implementing the recommendations, we'd obviously have to have a think about how we report that. And that's uh, it's only happened once about 10 years ago, uh, and it was exceptional circumstances. And we brought that up to committee with the service just to discuss the uh, circumstances. So um, we would always expect to be able to report to you that all the recommendations that are made in this council are implemented by, by services. And really, the, the credit there has to go to the services. Um, we're only overseeing what they're doing and providing a wee bit of support. Appendix four are the performance indicators for internal audit. And uh, I'm only going to highlight table one, uh, which are the two national performance indicators that are reported by the Scottish Directors of Finance. These are publicly reported. And if we look, and they always run about a year behind. So unfortunately, the best data I can bring to you today is for 21-22. Uh, so if you look at the middle column, 21-22 in table one, the first indicator is about the cost of internal audit. We always sit at the bottom of the table for the cost of internal audit. And I'll like, I think that's highlighted by the stats that are here. So the indicator is how much does internal audit cost per million pound of expenditure by the council? We cost just over almost £1,600 per million pound of expenditure by the council. If you look at the lowest spend, which is £359.81, which is only 23% of what we spend, and that's actually a council that's slightly bigger than us, my team is only six people, including me. So, and that's five auditors and a clerical assistant. That council must have one person at the moment. In fact, I know they've got one person and that runs all their internal audit, which means that they don't do very much. So to be bottom of that table for us isn't, I think, something that we... Uh, Badge of honour is the phrase that springs to mind. Maybe it's a badge of honour to be towards the bottom of that table because it means that your council's investing and committing the resource to internal audit, the necessary level of resource. 
So the indicators, they are what they are. The next indicator we always do quite well on, indicator 8.2. So that presents the number of days that you've actually achieved against the plan that you sent to your audit committee. So we achieved 102% uh, of days that we presented to you. So pretty much on target for the number of days that we thought we could deliver. If you look at the, the council that's come, so we were fifth in the country. We always sit usually in the top top five, usually one or two, we're usually first or second. We were fifth this time. There's not much in it between the, the top councils. But if you look at the council that was the highest scoring, which achieved 272% of their plan, you would never get that from me because I would bring you a revised plan up with revised days. Basically, they've achieved three about 300, three times their plan. So I wouldn't be doing that without bringing a revised plan up to you and saying, here's actually my revised number of days. So the fact that we sit around about 100% of our planned days, I think is good and it's positive because it means I'm bringing you a plan that's realistic and achievable and telling you, my best guess of the days that we're going to have. And then I bring you a revised plan. Some years I bring you two revised plans if things change significantly. So you will always have the most up-to-date position of the number of days that I think we can deliver as an audit team for the council. So the statistics are there, they're public. So I feel it's useful to bring them to committee because they're out there, but we take them with a bit of a pinch of salt. So hopefully I've given you enough context there to take some assurance from them, but also, you know, uh, just to just to, to, to understand that they're, they're not perfect by any matter of means. If I move on to Appendix 5, and there's an awful lot of stuff in Appendix 5 because this is what our statutory and regulatory uh, requirements um, lay out that we have to do. So the first few pages are about the um, continuous improvement actions that were set out in our internal uh, quality assessments over, over the years. So the fact is the sea of green is good. These are all our continuous uh, improvement items at a level of granularity in terms of what we do day to day. And we have continued to have these in place since uh, the early days of the new uh, statutory requirements. So the only area in here that I wanted to highlight to you today, members, is on page 48, 48 and 49, which leads us on to the external quality assessment and the most recent external quality assessment, which was presented on the 20th of April. And if you remember, there was four recommendations in that report, four low level recommendations, two advisory and two low priority. And we talked about those at the time and simply what this quality assurance and improvement programme model is now demonstrating that we've done them, that we've put them in place. Uh, and you saw evidence of that in the reports that I brought up uh, on the 20th of April in terms of the annual report for 22-23 and the annual plan for 23-24. So it was all about presentation of those reports and sort of minor presentational aspects. Um, the fourth uh, recommendation, the fourth advisory recommendation there on page 49 was just putting down the marker for the international review of internal audit standards. Very usefully, um, SIPFA, who used to independently, 10 years ago, SIPFA used to independently set standards for local government internal audit and then became part of a bigger international gang that's uh, um, with the um, Institute of Internal Auditors. And what happens now is if a cog, if the big cog turns in America and China, we get affected here in East Ayrshire. So basically what's happening is a root and branch review of what internal audit's about internationally. And that affects then the regulatory standards that we have to work to. And root and branch is the phrase that SIPFA are using at the moment. There's some quite um, uh, heated debate going on uh, in the last few weeks. We're at the centre of that. We're involved in the, the Slacky Ag uh, consultation through SIPFA. And there are some 
ridiculous uh, areas getting uh, proposed that uh, we would need to apply um, very, very detailed international uh, working arrangements to every single piece of audit we do. I couldn't decide what was best for us locally. I would need to apply this international checklist, which may not be particularly relevant uh, for us and doesn't reflect national legislation either. So we are we are not entirely impressed with this um, with this process. We're doing our best to influence it. I don't know what's going to come out the other end of that sausage machine, but we're there and we'll try and get the best result for us at the end of the day. So that's all I can give you assurance on members, but just to be aware uh, that that's on, ongoing. I'm hoping there'll be compromises and we'll get a sensible solution at the end of the day. It's wholly unnecessary for Scottish local government, in my opinion, because it's working quite well at the moment for, for most of us. But there we go. We're, we're part of that uh, international uh, process, which uh, is uh, unfortunately is not as glamorous as it sounds. But there we go. So thank you very much, members. Happy to take questions as always, Chair. Thanks very much, Ailey. And I'm sure we'll hear more about the size international review uh, in the coming months. <laughs> OK, members, do we have any questions or comments for Ailey? Councillor Mabin. Hi, Ellie. Thank you for that report. Um, quite amusing that you were the chair of Slackyag at one point. That's a, of all the anacronyms, it's, oh, that just tickles me, that one. Um, appendix 2, the, there was a job number 31, non-PCOS transactions. I, I think I remember right, it's PCOS, the procurement software. So what, what is non-PCOS? So PCOS, you're absolutely right. PCOS is the procurement software. Non-PCOS is anything that doesn't go through PCOS. <laughs> so it's as simple as that. Uh, and that can be for a number of reasons. We've got a number of other business software systems in the council that have purchasing modules. And uh, for, for various historic reasons, some services put their orders through those uh, purchasing modules which sit outside PCOS. And it's been something that's been a matter of review over the years. Uh, and uh, it's on the table again for review to see if we can do that in a slightly different way. But we so we have uh, procedures for PCOS and we have particular procedures for non-PCOS and we audit both areas. So we have full coverage of all purchases across across the council. Thank you, Ailey. And Chair, if I can come back in. Yeah. Um, on, on the same Appendix two, jobs 34, 35. And there's another one, top of page 31. You have a couple of jobs deferred for later, and you were saying you have a couple of new people coming in in June. Uh, just in general, talking about your team, the size of your team, and you're bringing new people in, so you've got to grow your team. I know there's problems with loads of different organisations trying to get audit and done properly um, and trying to attract auditors into your team. Um, these jobs look like they're also computer IT specialist type of things. Um, just in general, how's your team and how's your team growing? And, and will the, I take it these two will be picked up later. Thank you. You're right, these uh, deferred jobs, uh, they've been added to the 23-24 reserve list. So if resources become available, we'll review them to, to see that part of the reason we deferred them was they weren't actually uh, the highest risk and top priority. I always have discussions with the services around these areas and I was comfortable that we we had reasonable, um, at least reasonable uh, arrangements in place. So I don't defer lightly. I defer on an informed basis, uh, but we will uh, pick these up in due course should they become a higher priority. So again, the, the risk assessment will be will be carried out at that stage. In terms of the team, uh, Councillor Mabin, uh, as you know, at the moment we have six people in the team. So I've got four qualified accountants, including myself. I've got a very experienced uh, um, audit assistant and we have a clerical assistant. 
and we have two graduate interns coming in. So we are one of the better resource teams for a council of our size, uh, but we actually do have a, a remit that's wider than some of their internal audit teams, because as you know, we look after the IGIB, we look after the Leisure Trust, we look after ARA, and we look after the Ayrshire Growth Deal. I'm the chief auditor for the Ayrshire Growth Deal Pan Ayrshire, so I coordinate the, the work for uh, uh, across the Ayrshire. So that has um, that has increased uh, our um, our workload over the years, uh, and it's our work is much more complex than it maybe was ten years ago. So the team have had to be the current team have gone through you know a kind of sea change in terms of uh, their requirements. We have two people who have gone through the um, uh, training to become uh, more computer audit literate. I won't say they've become computer auditors because it was a year's course, so uh, it's a very complex area, but they're much better prepared to do those computer audits. But we also use outsourced computer auditors, so we go out to tender every few years uh, for a, a contract um, for computer audit. And uh, that that serves us well. We quite often use the outsourced computer auditors as a critical friend. So we'll try and do as much as we can ourselves in certain jobs, and we'll bring in the outsourced uh, computer auditors to oversee what we're doing, um, and just to, to give us assurance that we're, we're going in the right direction. Which I don't think there's been any significant issues there. So that's always always quite good. Um, the graduate interns we're bringing in, uh, we're hoping that moving forward, we can uh, find a place in the team, uh, perhaps for one of them, perhaps for two of them. There are also uh, opportunities coming through the SIPFA graduate intern programme, which Joe McLachlan and his team are launching in a few weeks uh, with external recruitment. And uh, in fact, uh, Julie's at the other end of the table. So Julie and our team are very active in uh, Start re restarting our SIPFA trainee programme, which we, we used to, to run in the council. So a number of trainee accountants will be brought in and as part of their training, they will spend a minimum of six months on rotation with internal audit. So we'll get some additional resourcing uh, through that as well. And they may, end up, they may end up getting jobs in internal audit. We've got one senior audit vacancy at the moment and um, I'm considering holding that to see if any of these trainees coming through in the next few years uh, can then uh, come, uh, come into our team as, uh, as a qualified uh, auditor. So it's never easy. We do quite well when we go out to recruit. There is a limited pool out there, uh, as, as we all know, and uh, councils suffer from that. When we went out last uh, summer to recruit a senior auditor, uh, we got a reasonable number of applications. I know other councils were out at the same time, didn't manage to get anybody. Um, we managed to, to recruit from another council. Over the years, we've recruited. People want to come and work with us, and that's always nice. So we've recruited. My team at the moment are people who've come from Perth and Kinross Council, North Ayrshire Council, Glasgow City Council, and... Um, uh, that's the, the 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 three most recent uh, employees that we have have come from those other councils, and a number of them coming sideways moved to come and work here. So that's uh, that's always good to know. I think the perception is we're quite good at what we do here, but they'll also get the opportunity to work across a large number of areas because of the sheer. Uh, with the work that we do in the internal audit team here. So it can be a bit siloed in some other councils, particularly bigger councils, where they only get to work maybe in one area, which is always a bit dangerous uh, in terms of uh, can get a bit cosy, but you don't get a broader view of what's going on across the council and its partnerships. So that's been the reason that we've managed to attract some people just because of the reputation we've got and the width and the breadth of the work that we do here. So hopefully at any point if we need to go out again, uh, we will be able to attract people. But in the meantime, we're focusing on the growing your own. Uh, and with the fantastic help of the, the finance team in supporting and funding the SIPFA trainee programme, which is, I think, a fantastic opportunity uh, for people out in our, our community. Okay, thanks, Ailey. Um, Dale's got any questions, comments, really? Nope. Okay. Can we agree the recommendations on page 20? And agreeing. Um, point number five, 
in particular that we are satisfied with the current internal audit reporting arrangements as laid out in Appendix 5, Observation 5 on page 28. Yep, we agree with them. OK, thank you. Yelly, thanks very much for your reports today. Thank you. OK, and we'll go on to item 5 now. And it's an update on East Ayrshire's Suicide Prevention Action Plan, and that's by Joe Gibson, Head of Wellbeing and Recovery. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great, thanks. Okay, um, today's paper is to update the Committee on the Progress in um, delivering our local suicide prevention action plan during last year, 22-23, and to introduce um, the current plan for 23-24. Um, we also update on the publication of the national strategy and work that's ongoing on a pan Ayrshire basis. I would set out by saying that I think our work to try and reduce and prevent suicide will never be done and our action plan is never finished. So I invite committee to note the action plan today that I think it's a, it's a piece of work that we're constantly reviewing and evolving. I'm just flicking between screens, apologies. So in September 2022, the government published its new suicide prevention action, suicide prevention strategy. It's called Creating Hope Together. This supersedes the previous strategy, which was called Choose Life, and the one before that that was called Every Life Matters. We've began to feel as a team that it's confusing to track the different names of the national strategies. So we're now just locally talking about our suicide prevention strategy and action plan to try and keep that clear for people. The vision of the new strategy is, of course, to reduce the number of suicide deaths in Scotland while tackling the underlying inequalities that contribute to suicide. The strategy sets out four long term outcomes and builds on a lot of the prevention work that's already been going on across Scotland and in East Ayrshire. The four outcomes are one, that the environments in which we live promote uh, conditions and protect against suicide in terms of both our environmental, but also financial and physical environments. Outcome two, that our communities have a clear understanding of suicide, the risks and how to uh, how to act to prevent suicide. Three, that everyone affected by suicide is able to access high quality, compassionate support. And four, that our approach to suicide is well planned and delivered um, and is multi-agency. We are the United to Prevent Suicide groups currently working on the, uh, reviewing our local work against the new strategy. Because over the few months since the strategy was published, we have instead focused on ensuring we're implementing our current plan with a, an eye to the impact of the cost of living crisis. So at paragraph eight, I start to set out what we understand about the impact on suicide rates from recent global and local events. You'll, you'll remember back in 2018, particularly in East Ayrshire, we felt the sharp pain of a sudden rise in suicide deaths in East Ayrshire. That led to the Chief Officers Group um, commissioning a detailed analysis of the 50 most recent deaths to understand some of the patterns and issues behind that. That analysis reported back in October 2020 and the findings of that analysis still form the foundation of our action plan today. As I mentioned, there has been concern about the impact of cost of living on potential risk for suicide. At paragraph nine, I mentioned that a recent article published by global national leaders in terms of mental health report that there is no evidence of a worldwide increase in suicide since the pandemic. However, we can't be sure that that is the case in low and middle income countries. However, the current economic forecast presents, the authors describe, a new challenge. So in paragraph 11, and a review of extensive evidence shows that following the Great Depression of the 30s, the 97 Asian economic crisis, and the 2008 global financial crisis, there was a clear correlation following that of an increase in suicide. 
particularly for uh, working age men. So today there's a general consensus that we are in a period of economic um, challenge and there is a general acknowledgement that suicide risk may increase in some particular groups, particularly working age men and other groups who are already vulnerably impacted by the pandemic, such as women, um, ethnic minorities, people with disabilities and healthcare and hospitality sector workers and children whose parents are vulnerable. So the authors suggest that now is the time to act uh, with um, strength and uh, united across a, a range of agencies. That's what our current action plan sets out to do. The full article, it's a, it's a it, very interesting read, is there at section 12. In terms of what we're seeing locally in East Ayrshire over the last year, although official figures aren't going to be published until August this year, what, what our analysis shows already is that figures may be reducing, but we can't confirm that until we get the final published figures. So from section 14, we present some of the work that we have focused on in the last year and the impact that's having. You'll be aware that we've been selected as a pilot site for both a distress brief intervention pilot and a bereavement pilot. The distress brief intervention pilot helps to support a range of people who are suffering distress and work with them early, both through the GP practices and the workers we have in there, also in emergency departments and further plans to roll out across the Scottish Ambulance Service and the Police Service. This is in recognition that around 50% of all cases where someone completes suicide, that person was not in touch with specialist mental health services. So this is not solely a mental health issue. So our response must be more whole system. The Pan Ayrshire Bereavement Pilot continues and we have ex uh, gained extension of that funding for another two years. This supports families that have been affected by suicide and stays alongside them for as long as is needed, um, offering emotional and practical and psychological support. There's been a huge focus on our training and awareness raising efforts across the last year, building on previous progress. Um, and you'll be aware of the Here to Listen campaign across East Ayrshire. To date, 436 people at the time of writing this have been trained in suicide first aid. And with additional funding from the cost of living programs, we're on track to reach our expanded target of 600 people being trained by the end of 2023. We did in, um, create a new process where people trained to be first aid champions, um, suicide first aid champions, and they provide support to other people who are in crisis, are now able to feedback about the number of interventions they're providing and the possible impact that's had. So far, 159 such interventions have been reported back to us. In December, we held a Pan Ayrshire uh, Suicide Prevention Conference to update all agencies and stakeholders about work underway and consider further opportunities to increase support. We continue to review every suspected suicide in East Ayrshire by a multi-agency group to identify learning and opportunities and any associated risks. We've just agreed further investment in this area to appoint a suicide prevention project officer to support this analysis and shared learning and to further support families affected. Last year, we also appointed a tackling stigma lead officer who's been busy out in our communities holding conversations and events to help people challenge some of the stigma and stereotypes they're holding and increase understanding and awareness. So our full suicide prevention action plan is um, attached at appendix one, appendix one for your information. This will continue to evolve as we learn more. Um, a number of things just I'll draw out briefly in terms of the updated plan. We have renewed focus on our uh, locality models to support children and young people through our heart model, get the support they need um, at, at the time they need it. We have increased work on water safety and training into schools to help people stay safe around water. We have worked with the National Missing Persons team 
to try and use data about missing persons more speedily in order to put support around people who are vulnerable. We are refreshing our training frameworks and ensuring access to more people um, and that the training meets everyone's needs in different parts of the organizations. And we're expanding our support for veterans and people in touch with the justice system, as these are also high risk groups. So I'm happy to pause there, Chair, and take any questions or comments. Thank you. Joe, oh, thank you very much. Um, so I can see part of it. I'm quite sure no wish would, there was no suicides anywhere, but unfortunately there are. Um, I take the point about the cost of living. You know, cost of living crisis and the pressure that that's placing in a lot of individuals for various reasons. Um, but we know life is precious and it's fragile, and we must do everything we can to protect it. Um, and raising awareness certainly about prevention strategies, suicide prevention strategies is absolutely priority. Um, and my other life, my mother working life, um, when I've been working in ED. You know, I've seen some well, victims of attempted suicide, ranging from age eight, and a young mother who had postnatal depression. So when when it says that people are not known to mental health agencies, that is absolutely the case for me. That's been my experience in my other in my other life. Um, so it is it sad and. You know, and my, my door's always open if anybody needs any time, you know, just, you know, get stuff off their chest. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm an open door for everybody and anybody. Uh, yeah. Does anybody have any comments or questions for Joe on the plan? Anybody online? No? No, no. So I, I see that, you know, East Ayrshire, um, we've got mandatory suicide awareness training, Joe, and it's under the policy legal implications. Um, given the structures within East Ayrshire Health Social Care Partnership, it's important to ensure parity across NHS also. Can you just give us a wee bit of background to that? Um, is NHS all trained? Is that mandatory training or is that being considered? Or what can this committee do to help that process? Um, Chair, I understand that in the NHS, different groups of staff, um, it would be mandatory for some groups of staff, but not all. But I would need to find out more information about which groups are currently eligible for training. Some of our work about awareness reason will ensure that all staff, as well as community members, have a basic understanding of identifying some of the risk factors and some of the steps people can take. And it's exactly as you describe about people being available to have conversations, ask direct questions, very um, open and active listening, and ensuring that we help people ask for help when we think they need it. So it's our awareness reason program coupled with the training program that will ensure our communities are most ready to react. But I can come back to you with more detail about which NHS groups are entitled to mandatory training, if that would be useful. I think I, I, that would be helpful and if there was anything that this committee could do in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, helping that process, then that would be good information for us to have and to be able to support Joe. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much. If anybody doesn't have any questions or comments, then can we agree the recommendations? Okay. Oh, I beg your pardon, Councillor Mabin. Hello, thank you. Um, we all know there's a huge waiting list for mental health services through the NHS and a lot of folk are turning to various charities to get help through counselling and stuff. Um, is there more support coming? Is the Scottish Government going to help us out and try and get better access to mental health services, get these waiting lists down so that folk can get help quicker? Just get your opinion on that, please. Thank you, Councillor. Um, through you, Chair, Scottish Government are very aware of some of the challenges we're facing. We met with Scottish Government yesterday in terms of some of the challenges in mental health services, both for children and adults. There's a new mental health and wellbeing strategy 
that the Scottish Government have been working on for some time that's due to be published next month. Um, what my understanding of the strategy at the moment is that it sets out some um, short term priorities, but also identifies that there's a longer term journey of improvement required and that that will take considerable funding. And at the moment, that funding has not been identified. Having said that, locally, we are doing what we can to try and manage those waiting lists and support the teams who are under a huge amount of pressure to deliver that care. Um, and our third sector colleagues have been phenomenal in supporting that work. Through the cost of living funding that the council agreed, we've increased funding, not only in terms of training for suicide prevention, but also we've increased capacity in our community mental health team, our East Ayrshire addictions team, and to the third sector in terms of expanding the amount of counselling available there. So we are also really focused on ensuring that where people develop or symptoms become exacerbated or people slip into crisis, that those crisis responses are still available for people quickly um, and effectively. So although people might be on waiting lists to be seen, if things get worse, they will get help much quicker. Excellent answer. Thank you very much, Joe. So, Joe, can I just ask, so if someone is having a bit of a tough time mentally and they're at that crisis point, do we have enough signposting for these people to whom they can contact. Um, so, and, and I'm thinking, you know, so if it's in the wee small hours of the morning, when that's most, you know, it's a bad time for a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. who they can contact and, and that the access is going to be there for somebody to speak to them or help them. So, thank you. It is an area that we think we can improve on. So, part of the action plan talks about our um, calendar of events and developing a campaign around being brave. Um, and lifting the phone, telling somebody um, or uh, asking for help. So we will, we will, you will see more around that in terms of our communications. At the minute, thankfully, processes are quite joined up. So if you were to call um, an ambulance, your GP surgery, the out of our social work team, the, crisis, the mental health crisis resolution team, if it's the wrong team, they will connect you to the right team out of ours. So help should uh, be available. So uh, I think it's important that we don't need to teach all members of the community how to navigate our really complicated system. We just need to make sure behind each of those phone numbers that, the, that we can join the systems up there. And that's what we're focused on. But we do think that there is a piece of work to do to educate the public that help is available, to break down myths about, you know, the waiting lists are too long, you can't get a GP appointment, and therefore maybe people not taking that step to ask for help. So we're going to do a piece of, um, a media piece around that. that thanks, Joel. Councillor Hogg, you want to come in? I sorry, um, just to, to kind of highlight, like every other area, um, there is a recruitment problem within the NHS. Um, we have lots of posts that remain un, unfilled. Sitting here in my surgery today, we have posts that are unfilled. Um, so there is, a, a, as much work has been done, fantastic work on the front line, we do have a recruitment mm -hmm. problem and that mm -hmm. adds to our waiting lists, unfortunately. I don't um, have much to add on that. That's absolutely the case and it's a well-recognised challenge. We've seen teams try different approaches to recruit at different levels or make jobs more flexible. Um, I also think that we have a huge challenge in supporting the teams that are there because of the vacancy rate. The people who are at work, are they have very challenging jobs. So we need to look after their well-being as well. So it may be at times we need to talk about what we can't do at the moment while we try and build back up some of the services that are particularly challenged. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Joel. And I think it's also important that we have funding 
you know, to support these services continuing on. Um, and like, you know, until such times as, you know, there's zero suicides. And as you say, Joe, you know, that's a long way off probably, yeah. Okay, yeah. David, see just in terms of the recommendations, in terms of that policy, you know, the legal implications in the policy that was asking Joe, so she's going to go back and ask for which sections of staff. So is there anything that we could add in terms of that? Sure, I'm just trying to get to the wording and I know you've got it. I think to be fair and through you, Chair, the, the, the question you were raising is, is that as a statement says EAC has already opted to make suicide awareness training mandatory given the structures within the health and social care partnership. It's important to ensure parity across the NHS. So I think the purpose from our discussion before, not I'm a main reader, but you'd raised it before the meeting. I think the issue, Joe, is what steps are being taken to achieve that parity rather than what's the starting point we will obviously inform it so the answer given was we'll establish what groups already have it as mandatory but the policy statement there and it's only a reading of the report that's produced suggests I think that you know it's important to ensure parity. I think it's a question of which way up. Is this East Ayrshire gaining parity with the health and social care, or is that an aspiration that now we've made it mandatory in East Ayrshire to also uh, bring the the health and social care partnership up to parity? I think it's just understand. It's not entirely clear which way is up, Joe. Who's catching up with other here, and what 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 is that statement intended to convey? Because that would impact on any recommendations about what the committee might be. Able to do to support the direction of travel. So I think it's the direction of travel that maybe just needs clarified. Is EAC catching up with? And I, I don't want to use catching up as if there's some deficiency, but is EAC gaining parity here or is EAC going ahead with the mandatory training and then parity will need to follow by putting arrangements in place for the health and social care? In short, which way is up, Joe? Through you, Chair, can I respond? Yes, please. Yeah, so perfectly put, David, which way up is it is mandatory in East Ayrshire Council employees, but it is not mandatory across all NHS employees. And as you know, in the Health and Social Care Partnership, we are made up of both. So there is a Pan Ayrshire training group who will be looking at this in more detail. I don't have that detail to hand just now, but I would I'm happy to come back to you about that. I would suggest that there's a process to identify which groups in the NHS would need to be provided with mandatory training. So I'm happy to come back with an update on that. And it may Richard. be better to wait for that before we identify what um, action the committee might want to take. I think that probably makes sense. I think we need to know the what, or, or the current position in terms of the, the work to be done under the action plan for that group to identify what's required. And then uh, if the committee wants to ask for that to come back or maybe leave it more open ended rather than create work, that might not merit a report, would be maybe to build into the recommendations that the committee would welcome back, uh, not just any update, but any uh, particular request that for support from the committee, the committee might be able to give to that desire to achieve that parity. In other words, leave it open for a further report by should there be, it can be considered there's anything the committee can do to assist that achieving that aim. Yeah, I think yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, is that okay, Joe? Yeah, yeah that's good. Okay, everything. Councillor Watch, sorry, I've missed your hand there. You want to come in? Oh, no, you're fine, uh, Chair. Um, it was just to really thank Joe for the report. Um, with someone who has experience uh, of a, many years ago now, but a young family member committing suicide, um, it's heartening to see the steps that we're putting uh, into place. Um, and But also I think we need to look at um, when someone has committed suicide, you know, the effects that it has on, you know, the family and other people, um, mm. you know, suicide is it's an awful situation for someone to to get in and any prevention, you know, that can be put into place is um, very, very much welcomed. So thank you, Joe, for the report. Thank you, Joe. 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 Thank you
Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Watts. Okay, so in terms of the the recommendations, we just agree the recommendations as is. Not that right? Yeah. Okay. So if you want, we can build an extra one along there, which is leaving the door open in terms of uh, if on the development action plan, it's considered there's anything GNS can do to assist achieving parity in the training provision across the partnership, then it would come back. Yeah. Um, members can we agree that with that recommendation included? Yeah, that happy that. Okay, Mr. Hogg, you happy with that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Joe, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and moving on to item six, secondary school lever attainment. Over to Linda. Yeah, good morning. Apologies, uh, through you, Chair, I'm going to ask Graham again to present this report on our behalf. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Chair. Um, good morning, members. The purpose of the report is to provide members with a summary of school leaver attainment for 2021-22, following the release of national data at the end of February 23. The recommendations are detailed in paragraph two, and there's a number of areas that I would like to, to highlight as we go through the paper. Paragraphs three to nine describe the approaches to certification over the past three years and explain how results in national qualifications were awarded particularly in 2020 and 21, when national examinations were cancelled. And to exemplify this, what I'd like to do is highlight the experience of young people who left school in S6 in session 21-22, because these young people experienced three different approaches to certification. So three different approaches to receiving results. So in 2020, when there were no exams, these young people who left school in S6 last year were in S4, and their results were determined via what was called the alternative certification model. And that was based on teacher professional judgments. So teachers made judgments based on the progress that young people were making up to the point where schools were closed because exams were cancelled that year. And that determined the results that young people achieved. When these young people progressed into S5 in 2021, again, there were no exams. And the results for these young people were determined via a similar approach, alternative certification model, except this time, rather than being based on teacher professional judgments, it was based on course assessments that were completed in school. So no exams, but still course assessments going on in school. And that's how teachers then arrived at judgments to determine results for young people. In 2022, when these young people were in S6, exams, res exams returned, uh, which brought about a third different approach to results for these, these young people. The impact of the different approaches to certification can be demonstrated in paragraph nine. There's a chart in paragraph nine. And what that chart shows is the national awards. So it's not East Ayrshire, but nationally. National awards at A to C. Uh, and each of the levels, higher, national five, and uh, advanced higher courses. And in summary, what it shows is that in 2020, when results were determined by teachers' professional judgment, results increased from the previous year. But then in 2021, uh, when the results were determined by course assessments, results took a, a bit of a dip, decrease. And with the reintroduction of national examinations, the following year results decreased again. It's important background information when comparing year on year performance, as the approaches to certification were very different in each of those three years. I'm not discussing at this point the pros and cons of the different approaches that were put in place for the right reasons at, at that time in response to what was going on at each of the different times. Um, but it's important to be aware that the, they were very different approaches to certification. Paragraphs 10 to 16 detail the use of INSIGHT, a national benchmarking system, which provides schools and local authorities with attainment and achievement information. And a number of members might recall attending the training session, which was held back in August 22, where the use of insight was discussed in, in detail. Paragraph 24 details the stage when young people left school. So whether that was at the end of S4, the end of S5 or the end of S6. And in session 21-22, we had the highest percentage of school leavers leaving at the end of S4. We are keen for young people to remain in school beyond S4. To, to maximise their opportunities to gain qualifications, 
that are offered beyond levels typically offered in S4. However, 95% of the S4 school leavers progress to a positive destination when leaving school. And this might indicate that it was a, the correct decision for those young people as they progressed on to employment, education or training. Paragraphs 26 to 31 detail the initial destinations of school leavers in session 21-22. And I'd really like to highlight the initial destinations figure of 96.85% in session 21-22, as shown in the table at paragraph 27. It's the highest initial destinations figure achieved in East Ayrshire, uh, not just in terms of the figures that are displayed in that table, but in terms of our, our tracking of initial destinations, it's the highest we've ever achieved, and we're delighted with that achievement. It's above the virtual comparator, the South West Collaborative, and the national performance. I'd also like to highlight in paragraph 31, uh, that details how young people are tracked up to the age of 24. And it's important because if a young person progresses to a positive destination when they leave school, but aren't able to sustain that for whatever reason, then they are offered appropriate support to ensure that they progress to another positive destination. Paragraphs 32 to 33 detail the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework, the SCQF. Uh, and it, really what that is is a way of comparing Scottish qualifications in terms of how demanding or how difficult they're learning is. And the, the graphic uh, or image at paragraph 33 shows how current qualifications relate to previous qualifications. Paragraphs 34 to 37 detail attainment in literacy and numeracy at SEQF levels 4, 5 and 6. Uh, and what you'll be able to see is that each of these levels attainment in East Ayrshire compares favourably to the virtual comparator to the South West Collaborative, that's North Ayrshire, uh, South Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway, and the, the national figures. And paragraphs 38 to 40 detail attainment of school leavers based on national measures of the percentage of school leavers achieving one or more qualification at SEQF level four, five and six, with, with particular strengths coming through at levels four and six. The head of education and chief education officer and I are meeting with all secondary head teachers and their leadership teams to discuss individual school level attainment. And after this morning's governance and scrutiny meeting, uh, a file will be added to the members portal with details of attainment and the measures included in this paper for each individual secondary school. And finally, the achievements of this cohort of school leavers are significant, particularly when you consider the three different approaches to certification the S6 school leavers experienced that uh, uh, described at the start. So I'd like to conclude by congratulating the young people on their achievements whilst also recognising the support they received from parents, carers, teachers and support staff. So happy to take any questions. That, thank you very much, Graham. It was a really good report and definitely this committee does congratulate our young people. It's um, fantastic achievements this year. Um, the positive destination figure of 96.85% is very good. It's really good. Um, and I think SL33 has played a huge part in that. That's a big, huge success story, and I'm glad that's been rolled out across um, the, the authority. Um, so just a question for myself, and then I'll bring in Councillor Richardson. So a pupil in S4 two years ago who sat their exams for the first time, and they had their, um, the teacher um, alternative scoring on in the four, S4 and S5 and they were favourable so reasonably that pupil would expect a good result in S6 and if they didn't re receive the result that they were expecting how did we how did we how do we support those pupils going forward? Thanks Chair and I'll respond to that question so uh, there's ongoing tracking of pupil progress in schools, so, so schools are well placed to be able to support young people if they are progressing through a course, but maybe not progressing as well as they would, they'd hoped. So there is that ongoing support in schools. But in response to that, at the time, the SQA reintroduced appeals so that there was the opportunity for young people, uh, if they didn't receive the result that they, they, they hoped to achieve or were on track to achieve, that schools could submit evidence that they had generated throughout the year to support an appeal. Um, and, and that was considered by the SQA. So that was, that was how those young people were supported. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. Councillor Richardson, do you want to come in? Thanks, Chair. 
Uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate everybody involved in this report. I mean, 96.85% uh, of young people achieving positive destinations after school. I mean, that's just, that's a tremendous uh, achievement. So well done to Linda, everybody involved in education, the head teachers, the teachers, classroom assistants, the pupils, the parents. I mean, it's uh, it's just, it's brilliant news. Um, and it's good to see, you know, at least in East Ayrshire, that Scottish education seems to be doing really, really well. Um, but you know me, so I've got, there's a downside always, Linda, isn't there? So 96.85% have done well, but I'm worried about the 3.15%. Um, because obviously at Council, we, we had a chat about pensions and uh, it's it's basically, we can't afford 3.15% of the population to fall through the net. We just can't afford it because we need young people. We need every young person to become economically active and and contribute to society, not least to pay the old folks' pensions. So where I'm going with this is, and there's a good paragraph and it does answer my question to a certain degree. Uh, it goes on to say that, you know, the the people, the young people who didn't achieve an initial destination, an initial positive destination, they will be supported by SDS and East Ayrshire's Opportunities for All team. And it also, and I fully appreciate that, it goes on to say that, you know, there'll be a certain percentage of the 3.15% that, you know, through health reasons, etc. But, so, the, the physically active young kids who didn't achieve a positive destination, what do SDS and East Ayrshire's Opportunities for All team, what are we going to do to help these youngsters? Through you, Chair, and Councillor Richardson, can I just thank you for your commentary uh, around about the, the results? And I'll be, I'll be sure to pass that back to the teams. We like some good news in education, so um, thank you so much for that. OK, so in terms of SDS and Opportunities for All, and can I just say um, we share your focus on the, the other 3.15% not represented in that positive destinations figure, because that's exactly what we're looking at next. So two two things in the main. And first of all, I, I think, Chair, you recognise the effect that we're seeing um, SL33 having on our positive destinations figures, because I think as, a, as, as an education system in terms of East Ayrshire, we recognise that some young people will, through um, barriers to mental health or other societal reasons, find it really hard to get to school. And I think, you know, we need to be smart about that and actually give these young people somewhere to come and be loved and supported. And I think if you've, and I know you've visited SL33, I'm, I'm sure many of you have, um, that provides a venue for that wraparound support for these young people, be that support around about. Um, you know, social work colleagues or Department for Work Pensions or the wonderful Marjorie Harvey, who is our Opportunities for All lead in East Ayrshire. Um, so there's, there's, there's several means in which we can look to get into that other 3.15%. And the first of that is our plans to expand the skills and learning model. So to give these young people who find school hard to attend somewhere else to be without it being branded, you know, the previous models um, that have plagued um, education services, not in East can I say, but you know, a kind of bad boys club feeling to it, which this absolutely is not. This is a centre for love, nurture and further education. So we are expanding the SL33 model um, into Nether Third. Um, I know Councillor Kyle is already aware of that. Um, so we're, we're expanding the model into Nether Third and up into the Urban Valley, such that, you know, in all areas of East Ayrshire, young people will always have somewhere to be educated and call home if school becomes a place that they find difficult to attend. And again, without getting into the raft of reasons, which I'm sure we're all aware of, I think all the reports this morning um, indicate that. So we have huge plans to look at that for the percentage, we'll always aim for 100 um, regardless. But um, just to say, you know, health reasons can put a, a young person into the non-positive destination category. Incarceration uh, does the same. So there are only a few categories whereby a young person ends up non-positive. So recognising it will be hard to get 100% is always what we're striving for. And we really do believe that seeing the, the best figure in East Ayrshire's history um, gives us that traction to, to really go and do that. That now we're acutely proud of the services, but I would really like to point out the work of um, Ian Burgoyne and Marjorie Harvey and the team and all our head teachers because these conversations we have about young people are absolutely granular. And when Graham and I go out to each of the secondaries, we're, we're two down, five to go at the moment. When we go out, we're asking about those young people. 
and we're asking about their stories um, because that's going to help us learn. So it's a huge learning exercise. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we might even have further to go with this percentage if we can make it happen. So thanks again, Councillor Richardson, for those comments. Thanks for that answer, Linda. It's brilliant. The, the only other comment I would make is looking at the table, uh, leave us by stage. Again, it's great to see that most of our young people, or over half, um, stay on to BS6 nowadays. I mean, I'm thinking about when I left, way back in 1987, the amount of folk that left school at the end of fourth year. You know, sixth year, by the time the time you got to sixth year, I'm not saying I was one of the elite. I mean, you know, I was all right. I wasn't the brightest in the school. But by the time you got to sixth year, it was really only the, the brainiacs that stayed on for six years, for want of a better phrase. But that's brilliant. You know, when you see those figures, even going back as far as 2014, the, the number of youngsters doing their full six years at school uh, before they even go to university or college or wherever they end up, um, surely that's going to be a better preparation for uh, for life. So, no, it's a, it's a brilliant report. So thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor Richardson. And I see for um, those young people that, that are going to positive destinations, stuff, that's great, but for those who don't, and then maybe a year or two later, could they present themselves at SL33 or SL66 and receive that support to get them into a positive destination, get on track? I'm delighted to say they don't even have to do that because of the tracking mechanisms that we've actually got around about keeping contact with the young people who are in the non-positive and indeed the positive destinations. So uh, ultimately through the, the use of the, the kind of data hub and the whole 16 to 24 uh, tracking system, I mean, we are delighted in education. We find ourselves more and more um, involved in the, the full employability Um you know, scope and, and phase. So ultimately, um, we're working with these young people and indeed for some young people, we're working with their parents. So we're actually working with families in SL33. So it really does embody that sort of whole systems approach to, you know, supporting young people. So the great news is they don't need to present themselves because we'll, we'll probably have gone and chapped in their door already or Marjorie might have done or some of the, the workers aligned with that. So we keep in contact with the young people and they always know. And indeed, colleagues, SL33 is open during the summer. We've got a summer programme runs in SL33 because we do recognise that that six, seven week gap particularly in the summer holidays, could have quite an impact in terms of potentially maybe losing some young people um, out of the fold. So we we, we keep that open. Uh, and Marjorie and the team run a fantastic summer scheme um, over the, the summer holidays. And, and we run that um, in conjunction with our college partners and other partners in the system. So it's um, it's really great in terms of maintaining that contact. It's, it's once they become lost, it would be very, very difficult to bring some of the young people back. So it's about that regular contact and knowing at any given time without being invasive um, you know wh where they are so um, no testimony to the, the work of and the schools do exactly the same a lot of young people might leave school and then decide you know that they have that epiphany where they decide to go back and again those doors remain open so it's actually not just SL33 and certainly in my, my ex-head teacher role I welcomed several back in who thought it was time to go and then maybe realised no I'm just going to go back so uh, and I'd like to think that you know your, your comments there Councillor Richardson about staying on um, are, you know, again, testimony to a, a kind of modern and progressive curriculum where it's not about only academics and indeed we're offering things like, you know, the foundation apprenticeship in schools with a view to proceeding on to, you know, an MA or a GA um, at a later date. So I hope I hope that helps kind of quantify that piece, Chair. No, it does. And the apprenticeships is really an important yeah. and it's, it's a modern a modern way forward, especially for those that are not sort of academic, you know, so that's really, really good. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, Linda, could I just ask? So, oops, Councillor Maben. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, page 71, the chart that's showing what happened during the pandemic and teachers had to make their own assessments of what pupils would be getting. Um, were teachers just too generous at that point or is, it must be more complicated than that? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take that one. Um, I can't speak for other local authorities. What I can say in East Ayrshire, there was a very robust process put in place to make sure that an A in one school was the same as an A in another school. Um, we used our uh, teachers who work for the SQA as markers and setting exams and things like that. We used their experience and expertise to make sure there was consistency across schools. 
So whilst I can't speak for other local authorities in East Ayrshire, that definitely wasn't the case. Through you, Chair, uh, an additional commentary, and I, I also won't comment on other local authorities, but what I will say is our graph doesn't look like that. So that, that represents the national picture in regards to um, the, the effect of the ACM over the two the two years, and it was two different ACMs. Um, our graph doesn't look like that. So um, in regards to the robust processes, and, and indeed um, I've written to my staff to, to thank them because they were so robust in terms of ensuring fairness in the system um, for all of our learners. So um, we didn't see those huge effects that are maybe portrayed in, in chart nine, I think it was in the, in the paper. Um, we did see an effect. I think that's inevitable um, when you remove examinations from the, the, the system, but um, certainly not to the extent the national graph would potentially show. Thanks, Linda. Linda, this report is a mainstream report. So I'm wondering about our kids in ASN and the, the levers, the destinations um, for those young people. I'd be really, really interested to hear about them as well. Yeah, th thanks, Chair. And as you say, the, the data for special skills isn't included in the insight. So it's, it's not data that's included within this report. Um, however, I have checked with my colleague um, Ian Burgoyne, who's who's lead for destinations and employability, and we are able to gather some data around about that uh, destinations from special schools via a different source. It's not something I have to hand just now, but I'm happy to happy to provide that. That would be interesting for members um, at a later date. Maybe we can get a report together and bring it to committee at some point in the future. Yeah, and again through you, Chair, through the kind of ongoing work that we're we're doing um with our you know special schools around about you know the whole Park Willow Bank Hillside piece, we, we we're absolutely determined to introduce more work related learning in the same way that SL thirty three would, um in a manner that's accessible to a lot of the young people, recognising the, the the you know the huge sphere, um of additional support needs that can be present in a, a specialist resource, but we're um, absolutely determined to look at how we do that. And colleagues, you may already know we do huge work in the health sector um, with um, both Enable and indeed Project Search that you, you may have heard of and, and those young people are about to graduate from the programmes and that's our work-based learning based in the hospitals and um, doing all sort of manner of, of, of jobs in the hospitals so actually there's a kind of proud tradition of the, the work-based piece and a lot of these young people are actually kept on um, in these roles at the end of it's not a formal apprenticeship, it's definitely a work based experience. Um, but, you know, a really proud tradition there of working with um, our colleagues in both Enable, but also in Project Search around about facilitating um, high quality work experience, because that's where it can start for a lot of these young people in order to access a, a positive destination later on in life. So that helps. It, it does, and it's reassuring, and I'm quite sure that members have been interested to know for a report to come to committee in the future um, on that, so that would be great. Okay, members, any more questions or comments? You may agree the recommendations on page 69. Okay, thank you very much. Linda, Film, thank you very much. Moving on to item seven, derelict and dangerous buildings report by the Chief Governance Officer. Over to David. Well, this one and the next one, Chair of Members, my colleague David Wilson. Uh, well, he's here now. Yeah, that was panicking there. He was over there in a minute. Uh, David will, will present these two papers. Chair to members uh, for the detail. Thanks, David. Okay, over to yourself, David, too. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thanks, David. Um, morning. Um, this report uh, presents committee with an overview of the derelict and dangerous buildings within East Ayrshire, uh, which either present cause for concern and hence have been subject to the service of a formal notice during the 2022-23 period under the building standards or planning legislation, uh, or are subject to regeneration proposals involving the Council. Uh, as background, members should be aware that it is the responsibility of building and landowners to keep their property from becoming dangerous or untidy, such that it is affecting the wider area. Uh, the powers of building standards and planning uh, to intervene in such cases are relatively limited and primarily centre around where a building is dangerous to the public or those using them uh, and where a property is adversely affecting the wider amenity of an area. Uh, as highlighted at paragraph three, the properties detailed within the report include specifically buildings that are in a derelict and or dangerous condition uh, and which have either been subject to a complaint or formal enforcement action. 
Uh, buildings which are merely untidy in their appearance or land which is similarly untidy are not included within this report. Where the structural stability of a building is deteriorated to an extent where it is unsafe to persons frequenting the building uh, or to the public in general, the Council has mandatory powers to undertake necessary actions to make the building safe under the Building Scotland Act. In respect of derelict buildings, enforcement action is discretionary under the Building Scotland Act and Planning Act and may entail the Council to fund any enforcement work that is not undertaken by the owner. Fifteen dangerous building notices were served by building standards in the reporting period uh, to make an owner undertake works to return the building to a safe condition. On ten occasions, direct action has been required with debt recovery pursued against the owner. Two notable examples from the reporting period have been listed at paragraphs 6 to 12 for context, including a long-term problematic case uh, at Jameson Road in Darvo, uh, which has required a number of interventions over the last few years. In respect of planning, the Council has discretionary powers and may serve a notice on property that is adversely affecting the amenity of the area. This is often referred to as a wasteland notice which, if not complied with, could result in the Council initiating direct action under Section 135 of the Act and then seeking to recover costs reasonably incurred. During the reporting period, it is noted that from 14 complaints, one notice was served. Paragraph 15 confirms that there are currently no outstanding notices on listed buildings either. Uh, turning now to paragraph 16 to 38, these set out various plans and groups taking action or working collaboratively toward regeneration and reuse of properties and empty sites. This includes, for example, work with the New Covenant Development Trust in respect to the Castle Hotel and Trotters Building and a Davil and Area Regeneration Team in respect to the former co-op building site to be transformed into a garden and market site. Another notable return uh, to use of a derelict building is the former Greens Church in Kilmarnock, with what's now practically complete for the West of Scotland Climbing Centre. In respect of debt recovery from direct action, paragraph 39 and 40 highlight some of the challenges in debt recovery, with figures provided for costs incurred and recovered during the reporting period. In conclusion, it's noted that most matters in respect of potential derelict or dangerous buildings are resolved by active engagement and discussion by building standards and planning with owners to achieve desired outcomes. Additionally, grant funding has been used to enable and help various groups and owners with this. In some instances, though, notices under the Building and Planning Acts are necessary to remove danger or to secure improvement. The recommendations are set out at paragraph 2, largely to note the powers available uh, and the actions taken by planning building standards and other teams and groups. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, David. Does anybody have any questions? Councillor Lennox. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, David, for that report. Um, over, the, over the last year, we've had to send uh, operatives out to Muirkirk to the Trotters building, which is starting to get to the stage it's maybe not quite dangerous, but it's certainly deteriorating rapidly with pieces of uh, guttering falling off, etc. Um, the, the owner doesn't appear to be very willing to uh, get into discussions with any officers for the council, um, but are we sending are we sending the owner bills for the clear up teams that we need to send out on a fairly regular basis? Thank you. Thanks, councillor. Anything that we do require to do in terms of any notices that we serve um, in terms of our statutory uh, requirements. So, if, if for safety reasons we do have to intervene as a council and it's the owner that doesn't do it, um, then yes, the debt recovery is, is pursued through normal channels. Um, that building that you, you mentioned is, uh, is a frequent one that, that does come up. We do have officers have to go out to it frequently. We contact the owner and uh, the bare basic works are, are undertaken to make the building safe, again, in terms of our legislation. Um, but some of them are long-standing and frequent offenders, essentially, um, and it would be great to have longer-term solutions. But in terms of any interventions that we make, it's just enough to make the building safe. And as I said, if, if we have to instruct those works ourselves, then we do pursue debt recovery off the, the owner. Thanks, Councillor Lennox. Councillor Thanks, Chair. Um, I don't know the area that well, but when I was reading the papers, it was the, the case point nine, the former factory, Jameson Road, Darville. That was the one that kind of um, kind of jumped at the page at me. Um, and it was just really a quick question. J just so I've got, I think I know where this is. See if you're driving through Darville, heading from Comarnock to Edinburgh, so you're going, you're going east, basically. 
if you look over to the right hand side behind the main street, is that in in behind the main street? Is that the where you can actually see this this site? Is that where this is? Hey, Jameson Road, I think it would be off to your left, I think, as you would go through there and tucked in at the back. Um, although I may be misdirecting myself. Um, so um, <laughs> it, is, it is tucked in at the back right. off the main street and it's a large ex-factory site that, uh -huh. that's been derelict for a number of years. So is it's it, what you're seeing probably actually right. Is it, so. is it I mean, I take it we're talking a, a fair area of land. It's a substantial building. Um, we've had numerous interventions over the years. This is a building that has, has been left um, ownerless. Um, so we have the, the kind of problem here that there's no owner to to actually pursue so the debt. So we don't actually we don't actually know who owns it. Well, there there is actually no owner. It's it's with the KLTR, the King's Lord Treasurer Remembrancer. So essentially, there's there is no owner identified, and they they take a hold of that and try and dispose of that building. But in the interim, there is no actual person that, that owns the building right okay because because i'm just thinking i mean this is just me thinking off the top of my head we're always getting um you know we're getting local development plans all the time where we're developing green sites basically farmers fields etc and I, I don't know what the value of this land would be etc but if it's ownerless and it's causing vandalism and emergency services are having to go all the time is there any way that um East Ayrshire could take the land, clear it, and then put it on the market for development as a brownfield site to make to so that we can actually, you know, utilise the land and stop all the the issues around it happening. Ethan, I'll, bring I'll, I'll take that one, Chair, if you don't mind. Uh, the bottom line is as the KLTR we used to be KLTR Queen's Lord Treasurer and Remembrance. Uh, um, there are situations where land can find itself uh, ownerless. One of the biggest bugbears is if you set up a limited company and take title to land in the name of that limited company, and then if you just stop operating the limited company, then through the company's house processes, if you don't then submit two years of accounts, you'll get a notice, you'll then get struck off and your company's dissolved and ceases to exist. And that building sits there like that factory. And that's what happened with this factory. There is no legal owner. Uh, people believe that in that situation, title automatically transfers to the clown, crown, clown, crown, I better not say that, I get a shot, uh, the crown, but it doesn't. It's a process by which it then is rendered bona vacantia, which is ownerless, and they have first option, but the QL or KLTR as it is now won't take on onerous or you know land that has got liabilities to it, so they don't usually exercise the option. And what they're doing, they've launched a process now by which they're trying to get more in the front foot and not just say, well, we don't want it and leave these buildings but engage. So they're actually running a much more positive approach, almost on a pilot basis. And they approached us last summer actually in respect of uh, the former filling station down at Muirkirk not the Trotters building, where there's also a community interest in, uh, I mean, a former filling station's all right, as long as you don't disturb the tanks below the ground and they were emptied and all that, which they were. So the KLTR actually approached the council last summer uh, with a view to uh, whether or not the council would exactly that, take take title under the vesting order. And that is an approach we have done in other situations. The former Conservative Club in Sturrock Street was burnt down to clear the site and we uh, applied the process under the Companies Act where if a company owned a building, no longer owns it and you can show cause, in which case it's, we've just spent money under dangerous building legislation to make that building safe, then there have been occasions where we have taken title to the building. Uh, on this one, the KLTR made that ask of whether or not, you know, what, 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 whether the council was interested. But there is a community group that have expressed an interest in the site as well. And without going into detail here, the question was asked, but our estate's colleagues were of the view it wasn't appropriate for the council to take that one on. Uh, you know, there are other potential liabilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that one's actually been asked and answered in the negative. But I've actually just sent an email this morning because since then there's obviously been another recent fire at that building 
building. And uh, the bottom line is, is the, 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 there is no allocated budget for dealing with dangerous buildings, because as you've heard, in the first instance, it's the owners of dangerous buildings that should be held to account. And if there is an owner, we do serve the notice and require them to carry out the works. And if they don't carry out the works, we step in. And at that point, we will seek to recover costs uh, from from the owner. But the situation where it's ownerless is you don't even have anyone to serve the notice on, so you just have to step in and incur the cost. There's not even the prospect. There's nobody to send the bill to. So we have allocated out of balances or proposed to allocate out of balances subject to the usual uh, governance and approval uh, in terms of the year-end report uh, to try and create a pot of money. It's only few hundred, two hundred fifty thousand pound, I think it was, David, uh, to create the fund. But I can tell you now that if we set up it, because we've had to go out and demolish that factory in Darville in bits, you know, uh, one bit gets burnt out, so you demolish that bit. So I'm trying to, and the point of the email is to arrange an internal meeting with colleagues to look at what might be achieved. And if there is a genuine third party interest in developing the site, is it something we could take forward on a joint basis uh, in terms of if we were to make a contribution to the overall all demolition would that assist them uh, but what are their aims and ambitions etc and what what kind of funding arrangements are they looking or funding are they looking to pursue so there might be the merit in a joint approach but at the moment uh, that one was asked and answered and in both occasions the council came to the view it'd be better to allow those community groups to pursue taking the title to those sites under the same vesting or the process so we've stepped aside in both uh, based on that recommendation last year but we still have have to deal with and I'm just now trying to pick things up uh, as I say with state's colleagues, building standards colleagues, David there and uh, I've been community colleagues in the first instance with a view then if there's a viable option to take it to the group in Darvel to see if we can work with them to assist them to assist the community in terms of regenerating the site uh, but it is something we've done we're also in court the now for a vesting order on our favourite form of pub and cumnock uh, TC slash the Dagmar and uh, well it's got nothing to do with this paper whatsoever other than that as a dangerous building that road closure will be getting lifted in the 31st of May in Town Head Street in Cumnock and we're all glad for that so the point is that we haven't spent £200,000 fixing the building next to the vacant site that we were actually trying to fix we are also availing ourselves of the vesting order process and are in court just now taking title to that building but absolutely we have you to selling it on because we have no use for it uh, but again that one was ownerless uh, the company that owned that one was struck off from company's house in the way I described and it is a loophole in company's legislation uh, because what you have is one arm of the state that can sit there and make companies disappear at the stroke of a pen without any investigation of what they're leaving behind and of course they're not leaving behind anything of value because they've taken the value out before they wind up the company and leave it withering in the vine and you don't need to do anything wrong you don't need to commit any offences or breach companies legislation other than if you don't send in two years accounts they'll just dissolve you it's too light touch and in my view the company's house needs to be talking to the KLTR and other others to establish before they allow a company just to disappear and have no great no continued liability for buildings is to actually establish and I wish my life, what buildings have been left behind before they dissolve these companies but that's a different matter for another day but that explains how it isn't that unusual to find that you have onerous buildings can you know dangerous defective buildings buildings that only have cost in them no profit in them no value in them how you can find them ownerless on a far more frequency greater frequency than you might expect because the company's house process needs to be tightened up in my humble opinion so sorry that was a wee bit of a rant but... <laughs> thanks for that answer David that was a Thorough as usual. No, it's, it's it's just good to hear that, um, because again, I don't know the area. Darvel's no no my ward. I know that um, the two councillors from up the valley, yeah, Councillor Cogley and Councillor Clark, are only present today. They would know more about this area than I do. But you just read those few wee paragraphs, and you you can picture it, can't you? Uh, but it's good to know that East Ayrshire's got its, uh, you know, we've got our our uh, eye on it, David. So that that's good to know. Thanks, Councillor Richardson. Councillor Kyle, pop your mic on. Sorry, regarding the new Cumnock, it's absolutely brilliant to drive through New Cumnock to see the Castle Hotel looking the way it's looking already. And hopefully, hopefully, they'll do the same with the Trotter building. Unfortunately, your cut's not getting the same. But they have made a magnificent job of this. And as to the Cumnock thing, sorry, 
But see, when they take this rough cut, this thing down and open up the roads, they will need to put warnings up because they're flying round the square up down Head Street because there's no traffic coming for the right at the moment. That's going to happen next week. There's going to be mayhem. They need to put some warning in the square to remind people that the roads opened up again. That's something to take for. It's really, I mean, it's terrible trying to get across the road at the moment. They're literally flying round the square, straight up down Head Street. The people going up Gleason Street have to stop, but the ones going up down Head Street, and then this opens up. I don't know what will happen. So is Air Roads Alliance involved? I think they need to do something. Have you contacted I was actually spoke, spoke to Jim McMahon about it at a community council meeting because we were discussing it then. Okay. So I'll probably take that as an action. Uh, yes, I'll speak with Stuart afterwards and we can we can put an email to my colleague Kevin Braidwood as a head of ARA, just flagging up that concern and asking the consideration be given. Uh, obviously it's the 31st, so it's next week. We're actually mm -hmm. talking about lifting the road closure. I never thought that would become a timing issue the other way around, but there you <laughs> go. Uh, we we can uh, I'll make Kevin aware of the concerns that have been expressed and ask what can be done, even if it's some kind of advisory notice saying that it's it's reopened now. Uh, I just perhaps naively assume with the level of interest in it being closed that it would soon get round it was open. But uh, uh, and our, our our media colleagues, I don't know if we can say colleagues if we're, we're arm length, but I'm sure it will be in the paper as well. Uh, in fact, I know there was an inquiry, so I'm only kidding, uh, so we have confirmed. So I'll uh, ask Stuart just to we'll put a wee email after this meeting to Kevin Braidwood and uh, just ask them to, to, as we take it down, to see what they can do there to flag up the folk that it's no longer in place. Thanks, David. That'd be helpful. Councillor Mabin. I, I think locally I'm a Kilmarnock boy. The, the most dangerous building in Kilmarnock probably is a multi-storey. I take it it's not in this list now because the decision has been taken to demolish it. So that maybe was on the list previously a year ago. Have I got that right? Trying to remember if we actually classed it as dangerous, or if it was simply as as, as parts of it was the concrete. It was more about the analysis of the concrete and what was likely to happen. But the bottom line is, as we wouldn't normally report the ones that are in hand, and obviously that, that there are arrangements in hand for that. I think the main focus is the ones that are causing continuing blight in communities because there's no one in a position to deal with them. But I don't know if David can add in. I can't remember if the multi-story was in last year or not. But the main point is, as you know, that the matters are in hand and the demolition has been progressed. Uh, it wasn't in last year's report. It wasn't a, a, a dangerous building in terms of the, the building standards legislation. Um, so it wasn't requiring a notice or anything. So although it may be derelict and there may be long term problems with it, um, it, it wasn't dangerous in, in respect of the classification under the Act. Um, and also, as David notes, there's, there's been a uh, plans in place about what will happen there. So there is a kind of long term management of it rather than even being a, a kind of derelict building uh, with nothing happening. So it, it wouldn't have merited anything coming into the report. Okay, I'm going to bring in Councillor Watson and Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just slightly going back uh, a little bit. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to hear that Glazer Street um, will be reopening again on the 31st, uh, David. Um, and, uh, you know, I share Councillor Kyle's concerns about coming out of um, Luger Street back onto Glazer Street and Townhead Street. That is a, a particularly dangerous junction. However, um, it, I think it's worth noting as well with ARA, uh, David, that they issued on the 21st of May, a further notice of closure for a further 21 day of Glazed Up Street. Um, so just to ensure that uh, are, are aware that uh, the road is reopening on the 31st. 
Sure. Yeah, I, I noticed that from the press inquiry I referred to. Uh, I presume that obviously ARA would need to just update it, even though it was only for those few days from the 21st to the, the 31st. But absolutely, the, the most recent confirmation this week is that we are on track to basically take the scaffolding back to the edge of the footpath to finish the last bit on the side, remove all the scaffolding otherwise, and remove the road closure by 31st May. So uh, obviously they were covering the possibility these projects have slipped and can slip, but it will be the 31st of May, but that's just another reason then if it's actually out there that it might be a later period, then uh, we just need to reinforce folk. But I would expect, again, uh, that it should be uh, given the interest in them. It would be helpful if it was in the front page, but I'm hoping it will be in next week's uh, local paper as well, uh, because they, they've obviously been monitoring progress. So hopefully it will be in the local media, but we can look at what else might be capable in terms. I don't know, so I won't promise, but I don't know. But uh, see if there's any temporary signage that can urge caution, uh, road reopen. I'll, I'll, I can we'll put the ask to Kevin and uh, through, through the chair, well, through, we'll express the committee's concerns uh, around this and the ask, which is just to, to try and give people as much notice as possible that the road's now open again. Thanks, David. Councillor Richardson. Thanks, Chair. Um, last question for, for David. Um, and this is like uh, Councillor Maven, this is with my Comarnock hat on. Um, just a building uh, uh, in the town, the old picture house. Um, again, certainly derelict. I don't know if it qualifies as dangerous, but I just wondered uh, what's the situation with the old picture house? Because back in the day, that was a beautiful building inside. I mean, if MD ever sat in the uh, what they called the number one uh, picture house within that building. It was fantastic. Um, it was a wee bit worn and it was a wee bit uh, run down when it finally closed. But when you drive past it now, it's just really sad to see it in the states. And I just wondered if we knew what the, the situation is with that building. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that one. Uh, as it happens, as an aside, I actually managed a little bit of time the other day to tide out my office. And one of the things I found from about oh, 10 years ago was a pile of papers like that on the former ABC building. And, and that was 10 years ago. And there's another 10 years worth on that pile. The bottom line with that one is, is that from time to time there can be issues with the fabric of the building. So there has been plants growing, there's been a bit of dampness, there's been some water and, and the odd little bit of masonry came off a windowsill at one point. So we deal with immediate danger and any time anything has happened, there is an owner, it's a family in Airdrie. Uh, they were actually last in the standard last year, I think, saying they were going to put in X hundred thousand of pound of their own money to deliver a mini market type affair in there. That's one of a number of ambitions they have stated for the building over many years. So going back to the original legal analysis, there is an owner and when there is an issue with the building in terms of it straying into dangerous or any fallen masonry, then quite simply they fix it. So we do serve the notice, they do respond, they do the minimum. Uh, does it look good? No. And uh, does it make the town look better? Absolutely not. Do we have any powers if they deal with the imminent danger? No, we don't really. Uh, have we had engagement with them multiple over the years? Numerous meetings trying to get to a point of if you don't have viable plans, can we do something else with it? Can you sell it on to someone? But at the end of the day, the owners have always held on to it. They have never declared any intention to sell it other than an exorbitant price to the council who've got absolutely no use for it. It's also a listed building, so it's not an easy problem to solve because listed building and non-planning and building standards language just means whatever it would normally cost to fix it, double it. Uh, so the bottom line is that we have an owner who does the minimum to keep it safe and out with the scope of our legislative powers and who has articulated a number of plans and ambitions for it but has delivered in none of them over over well the life of this council and it's probably been an issue throughout the life of this council so that's more years than we care to remember 27 at a push so um, it doesn't come in here because it's not meeting that threshold but other than maintain it to the minimum standard necessary to keep our statutory powers at bay then at the moment it's been a repeated cycle of undelivered promises and I'll, I'll leave it at that no again thanks for the answer David 
um, as a Kilmarnock councillor, um, I've obviously got to mention the Grange Church and the success, the successful regeneration um, by a charity, uh, which is now the West of Scotland Climbing Centre. Um, it's absolutely a very a good news story, supported by the Scottish Government through the RCGF funding and also by this council through REF funding. And that's the kind of results that we're always aspiring to. Um, so that's a success story. OK, folks, are there any other questions or comments? No. So to me agree the recommendations. Yep. OK. Item 8, annual review of all planning, enforcement, and listed building consent, appeal decisions, and local review body decisions during the period 1st of January 22, 31st December 22. David. Thanks, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report is to present for information uh, an annual analysis of planning, including enforcement notice, advertisement consent, and listed building consent appeal decisions received from the Scottish Government Directorate for Planning and Environmental Appeals, which is the DPEA, uh, and a summary of the reviews considered by the local review body and the LRB during the uh, period of 2022. Uh, as a background, uh, the appeal route for certain applications will be to the Scottish Government, um, and that's usually uh, when an application is, uh, will be determined by a, a reporter. Uh, these cases are planning applications that have been refused by the Planning Committee, uh, advertisement applications and listed building consent appeals. Uh, where a planning application is determined under delegated powers and is refused, the appeals route is to the local review body, which is a panel drawn from councillors on the planning committee. In addition, as well as refusals, an applicant can also make an appeal against the terms of a condition imposed in any approval granted and can also appeal against the non-determination of an application by the planning authority where the statutory target set by legislation for determination has been missed and no agreement on an extended time frame has been reached. Um, as highlighted at paragraph three, there's been three appeals uh, that were determined by the DPEA in 2022, uh, all of which were planning appeals. Uh, the details of these appeals are set out at Table 1 and Appendix 1 from page 109 of the papers. Um, it's noted that all of the appeals were dismissed by the reporter, um, upholding the original decision of the Planning Authority. Uh, paragraph 4 highlights that there have been nine applications determined by a local review body in 2022, all following refusal of the planning application under delegated powers. The details of these are set out at Table 2 from page 112 of the papers, noting that seven of the nine were dismissed by the LRB and two were upheld, overturning the delegated refusal and granting planning permission. Um, I'd also like to correct a detail at paragraph five, which incorrectly states that six uh, were dismissed um, and three upheld, it was seven and two. Um, in relation to enforcement activity at paragraph six to 11, uh, members will note that 171 new enforcement cases were opened, 40 of which related to householder cases with the remaining 131 non-householder cases. 219 cases were dealt with and closed during this period. Enforcement cases are opened where unauthorised works have been carried out. In addition to these enforcement cases, a range of other function, uh, functions related to enforcement were carried out, including notices of initiation of development, notices of completion of development, planning inquiries, which often allege unauthorised works and therefore require investigation and compliance monitoring work. Some consideration is given to the ways of working and process enhancements in paragraphs 12 and 13, noting that there have been no appeals on the grounds of non-determination, uh, which indicates that processes to agree extensions of time with applicants and of keeping an agile performance process and trying to retain staff and recruit to vacancies have, at least in part, been successful. Finally, it's highlighted that no awards of expenses were made against the Council during the 2022 period and the appeals to the Scottish Government. Arrangements to minimise the risk of such expenses are touched on in the financial and legal implications section of the report, noting in particular that decisions should be governed by the requirements of the Planning Act in respect to the development plan and that sound professional advice from within the Council and on occasion external consultants is available to inform decision making. The recommendation is set out in paragraph 2, which is to note the annual review and otherwise note the contents of the report and I'm happy to take any questions that you'd have. Thank you. Thanks, David. It's good to hear that there was no awards made against the council in that year. But see if an award is made against the council, does it vary pending the application and the, the appeal? It would be based on the actual expenses incurred. So if, if you end up in an appeal, uh, if you end up in a court action and you lose, the normal principle is expenses follow success. 
So if you defend, raise an action or defend an action and you lose, you should expect to pay your expenses and other parties' expenses. In the planning context, it's not quite as dra draconian as that. Uh, the expenses test is whether or not someone acted unreasonably or vexatiously in either, in our case, making the decision or in their conduct of the proceedings. And if the reporter is of the view that someone meets that test, so it's not just that the reporter disagrees with you, they actually have to believe in bringing forward your position to those proceedings, you've acted that higher, met that higher test of acting unreasonably or vexatiously, then they can make the award of expenses and that would be uh, the expenses of the other party. But then they need to be reflective of and quantified against the work undertaken. It's not punitive, it's reimbursement of the actual costs incurred, which as you rightly identified would vary whether it was a one, you know, written submissions or a, or a two week hearing. Uh, so it can be, be quite costly. We've managed to avoid uh, them in the main, even where we have defended appeals. Obviously, the goal when you defend appeals is to to have the reporter agree with you and uphold your decision, because we wouldn't have taken that decision in the first place if we didn't believe it was the right one. But uh, the next outcome, the next best outcome is if the reporter doesn't agree with the merits, is at least he doesn't make an award of expenses, which means it's just a professional disagreement of views as opposed to we were so uh, far out the picture that you're, you're found to have acted unreasonably in taking the decision that we took that they have uh, then, then appealed. Uh, so, in the main, uh, we, I think the last one was for Fardale Hill uh, some years ago, and we do try and avoid it. It was better in the old days before they removed surcharge, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, do you have any questions, comments? No. So, we can agree the recommendations on page 104. Okay, thank you very much. So, item nine, final measurements and capital works contracts for the period 1st April 22 to 31st March 23. Thanks, Chair. As, as members will be aware now, we have a, a whole suite of reports that come on a regular basis, and the whole point behind them is, is to deliver on the openness and transparency and accountability that all inform uh, good and robust public services. We've always brought the one in the water contracts, and it was quite a long time ago now. One of the previous members of the committee point made the point, well, we know what contracts were awarding, but we don't see the outturns. It was also a time when the capital programme probably wasn't as, as, as in a robust a position as it has been over more recent years, once Alec McPhee got his hands on it and, and got it into good order. So... Uh, there was considered to be interest in reporting the outcomes on the capital works contracts because there is a perception, of course, that everything takes longer than it should and costs more than it should. And the point of this report is to highlight, yes, there are occasions when uh, the costs are more than expected. Sometimes uh, the reasons are given. Uh, sometimes that's because we've actually added to the works and the specifications, so you're paying more for more. Sometimes it's because uh, there's been an, you know, unknown problems once you dig in the ground, uh, extraordinary development costs. So what we try and do is give an insight into where they overran, where they didn't, obviously, and give the reasons and give that uh, further level of detail on these outturns. As members are probably aware, uh, there will always be a gap between the completion of a construction contract, the works on site, then you've got a long period before you get to your final contractual completion, because there's often a year's lay time uh, with the defects period, etc. So uh, some of these will have been on the go for quite some time, but the final measurements come at the end of the process, so we can't report them before we get there. Uh, but the purpose of this report is to let members see the actual outturn on uh, the, the contract that you've previously seen in the reports where we've notified what's been awarded. And as I say, the purpose is for members to see and raise any issues around any of these uh, where the, the explanation uh, requires any further, further expansion. But hopefully in most instances, the information is clear and where there has been any significant uh, increase uh, in costs, then the reasons for that are given and are considered to be adequate. I should also just remind members, as you probably know anyway, that any anything over 10% 
uh, needs to be reported to Cabinet anyway. So there is another check and balance in terms of control on cost override. Uh, if it gets to the point where anything is going to be more than 10% over the original cost or budget, then uh, it requires a Cabinet authority in terms of any additional expenditure. So that's another check and balance. We just focus on the construction ones because, as you would expect, most other contracts, you know, if you pay, if you agree somebody £100,000 to supply milk to schools for six months, the cost will be £100,000 unless they fail to supply some of the milk. So there's not the same scope for variation. Works contracts, therefore, are the, the focus of of this. And as with all these reports over time, they, they start to, you know, grow a bit. They can become a bit of a beast as we uh, embellish or identify and further improvement on the reporting. But the purpose is to keep it focused on the, the, the principal purpose and to try and keep the information we provide to what is relevant and meaningful to help you um, take that on, take that in. So subject to that, um, rather than go through them and pick them at random, I would really just, if there's any particular points or questions from members on any of these, we'll do our best or at least undertake to get any further information that might reasonably be required on any of these, but hopefully they are in the main self-explanatory and uh, satisfactory. Thanks, David. Um, do you have any questions or comments for David? No, no. I think the only one is it's just a comment. It's the command of bus station. Mm. <laughs> yeah, page 126. But it does give you the explanation below it. The golden rule is, Chair, members, once you've uh, awarded or agreed a contract, don't revisit it. And uh, but with fee goes at the bus station, so I'll leave it at that. Indeed, we will. <laughs> I'll be glad to see the work done at the command bus station completed. I'm sure you will as well, David. <laughs> okay, members, can we agree the recommendations? Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for your input today and your attendance. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye.